podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. This show originally aired on Sunday, July 3rd, 2022. This is episode 1908. Enjoy. Listeners of this program get an ad-free version if they're members of Club Twit. $7 a month gives you ad-free versions of all of our shows, plus membership in the Club Twit Discord, a great clubhouse for Twit listeners. And finally, the Twit Plus feed with shows like Stacy's Book Club, The Untitled Linux Show, The Giz Fizz, and more. Go to twit.tv slash club twit. And thanks for your support. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Good to see you. Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. And uh, it's time to talk about computers and the internet and home theater and digital photography and smartphones and smart watches and augmented reality and smart cars. And boy, there's a lot of stuff in tech these days. When I first started uh, doing this show, not when I started as the tech guy, that was 2004. That was the modern times. When I started doing call-in technology programming in the early 90s, that was simple. Those are easy times. We, we barely talked about the internet. And when we did, it was so this university uh, defense department uh, network of computers that you'll never have access to. <laughs> it was Windows 3.1. Uh, you know, I mean, it was it was a simpler time. Linux wasn't even invented. It was invented in 1992. That's actually maybe right about when I started doing this. We've come a long way, baby. Now it's pretty much everything in the world, isn't it? It's all tech. Anything with a chip in it. Phone number 8888-ASK-LEO, 888-827-5536. That's another thing that's changed. It used to be... Uh, you know, that's a toll-free number from the U.S. and Canada. It used to be, you know, you needed a toll-free number because it was so expensive to call long distance. <laughs> Not anymore. doesn't cost you anything on your cell phone usually, right? You're already paying for unlimited long-distance calls. Unlimited. And calling internationally a few pennies a minute? Wow. That you can, I think you can trace to antitrust laws and the breakup of Ma Bell. I think that's pretty clearly... The biggest success story of antitrust legislation. That may be in breaking up uh, Standard Oil. I don't know. I don't go that far back. But when Ma Bell was broken up, uh, long distance prices over the next few years tumbled because companies like MCI could come along. Do you remember that? In the early days, MCI, who was forbidden from using the lines owned by Ma Bell for the longest time, once Ma Bell was broken up, MCI could then offer long-distance service. Do you remember that? You'd get a PIN, a number, that you would dial first. So you'd pick up the phone, you'd dial this long number, your MCI number, and then you could make long-distance calls for cheap. I mean, for the time, cheap. If you, you know, 10 cents a minute or whatever. I always wonder what those early MCI toll charges were. I mean, they weren't what we have now. But that was the breakthrough. And, com and then competition, right? And uh, competition and competition. Of course, <laughs> the phone companies have re-merged. In fact, MCI was bought by Verizon. <laughs> uh, Worldcom, another one offering cheap long distance. You'd have a Worldcom card, right? Bought by Verizon. It's kind of, Ma Bell's almost reassembled itself. AT&T is the Death Star, the behemoth. Verizon. <laughs> Then there's T-Mobile, the young upstart, plucky young upstart, who's now as big as the other two. So I, you know, but hey, we still have, we have competition. Competition leads to lower prices. And the thing that Ma Bell argued for years, oh man, we, you don't want us to break up because we are preserving the sanctity, the strength, the power, the reliability of the nationwide network, if you broke us up, people would be putting their own, using their own phones. Yeah, you rem only us old timers remember this. You couldn't buy your own phone. You had to rent a phone from a company called Western Electric, a subsidiary of Ma Bell. You rented the phone. There was no innovation because there wasn't any need for it. There was no competition. And you couldn't put your own line. That was another thing. That changed with, again, good antitrust regulations, the very famous Carter phone decision, 
Supreme Court was ended up making that difference, allowing you to connect a device other than a Western Electric rented handset to the telephone network. 54 years ago, the FCC, Carter Phone. Um, in 1968, before Carter Phone, AT&T owned it all. They made the phones. They rented you the phones. You could not connect anything to, like a modem. Like a modem. Couldn't connect it unless it was from Western Electric. And they didn't make modems. <laughs> so you wouldn't have been able to com connect your computer equipment without AT&T's permission. Boy, that was an important decision. It was a huge decision. Um, a very famous case. So, good. Now we have competition in some areas, I guess there are... Now, you know, what happens with monopolies is they reform. And you have to kind of constantly keep on them. So now we have this whole issue with Google being so powerful. And, eh, you know, and it's kind of, you know, kind of the same situation. Same situation. Your phone now has everything on it. It's more than your phone. It's a computer. It's the computer for many people in their pocket that has everything in it. And that's why... Nowadays, when they're investigating criminality, what do they do? They seize your phone. Interesting case here. The Justice Department this week uh, seized iPhones from two attorneys involved in the January 6th probe. Campaign advisor for Donald Trump, John Eastman, who was the guy who kind of set up the, the coup. He figured it all out in a legal filing. Uh, June 22nd, federal agents stopped him as he was leaving a restaurant and took his iPhone 12 Pro. Now, you'd think, boy, I mean, that was a long time ago. You'd think Eastman would have erased any trace if there were illegality, if he did anything wrong. He certainly, would he, would he be carrying it around his phone? Well, the judge who signed the warrant must have thought so. Oh, here's an interesting thing. Eastman says, they took the phone and then showed me the warrant. I believe that because... They don't want you to mess with a phone if they know, you know, if a bad guy has a phone in his hands and you say, here's a warrant for your phone, bad guy's going to make that phone a little harder to get into. Eastman says, quote, he was, and this is a little line in the whole story, but one I noticed, he was forced to provide biometric data. That's interesting. So they took the phone. Here's the warrant. Now I want you to unlock that phone with your face. Once unlocked, of course, uh, federal agents almost certainly connected it immediately to a device that sucked all the data out of it. That's what they do. Made by a company called Celebrite. You just you plug it into the lightning port. All the data is now on a, on a drive inside that box. The phone, you can lock it again. Doesn't matter. I got everything. But this is an important point. He was forced to provide biometric data. And there is a, there's a debate in the courts over this, and different courts have ruled differently. But it has generally been held that you are protected from self-incrimination, right? We all agree. We know that. You are protected by the Constitution and the Fourth Amendment against uh, self-incrimination and, and uh, unlawful search and seizure. And the courts pretty much agree on that, you know? What they don't agree on is what is self-incrimination? Some courts have ruled, and most courts seem to agree, that asking for a password is in effect, especially for a phone where you presume there's a lot of good, juicy stuff on there, asking for the uh, password for that phone would be tantamount to saying, incriminate yourself. So many courts have said, police cannot ask for the password. They can take the phone. But they can't ask for the password. That's why you remember the FBI went after Apple saying, help us unlock this phone. It was locked. And they couldn't compel the defendant to give him the password. Well, the defendant was dead in this case. But the point remains. And it's happened in many cases. However, biometric information, that's interesting. Some courts have held that's different. You're not self-incriminating if the police hold the phone up to your face and it unlocks. Or are you? Isn't that, I mean, isn't that pretty much the same as entering a pin? Well, courts have said no. 
again, there's not universal agreement, and I and I think this needs to be clarified. But in general, in a case you're ever held up uh, by a federal agents and they demand your phone, you might want to know this, and this is why they took his phone before they gave him the warrant. When you have an iPhone with Face ID or Touch ID, if you press and hold the screen on and off switch for two seconds, you can lock it. And once locked, it needs your password, your PIN, to unlock it. Face ID no longer works. Law Enforcement Department of Justice knew that, obviously, because they said, give me the phone, and then they said, here's a search warrant. And then they said, look, into the phone and unlocked it. According to most recent court decisions, that, that, that was what they needed to do to get into that phone. And it, it apparently was not, it's not considered by many courts. We'll see. I suspect this will become a case. John Eastman uh, did not self-incriminate by providing the biometric information, whether it's the fingerprint or the face. Would have self-incriminated if they demanded the password. And he didn't have enough time to press that button for two seconds to lock it so that they couldn't do it without a password. Wow. That is a minor little footnote in all the stories about this, but it's an important one. And I think the other important one is that these phones are more than just a telephone. This is not, this is not your Western electric phone that you plug into the wall and you make, hello, operator. This is, uh, this is your life in here, right? All your location information, all your texts. I have all my passwords in there. I have my identification documents, my social security number. I mean, everything is in this phone. That's why you want to lock it and keep keep tight regulation. You know who has access to this phone, though? Every app that you put on it. <laughs> you know, I just bought a water bottle that uh, a stupid purchase. I don't recommend it, but it's a water bottle that monitors how much you drink. Right. So you drink, you know, you're supposed to drink enough water. So you say, I want to drink 64 ounces a day. And the water bottle somehow magically measures that. It's made in China. Nice instructions. Got 30 pages of instructions. One tiny page per language. It's 30 different languages. Uh, and the first thing you're supposed to do to use this bottle is hook it up to your phone. Get the app. Right? The app says, I want location information. Always. Why do they need location information to know how much water I've drunk? It's a Chinese company. Chinese app. Asks for location information. Hmm. And probably most of us just go, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just want to, go, I want to know how much water I drank. Yeah, 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 fine. This phone uses Bluetooth LE to see the bottle wherever it is, automatically copy the ounces from it. But I have to think there's more going on than just that. The apps on your phone know more than law enforcement does. And, and, and this is why Apple, and, and good for them, has introduced ways to restrict the amount of information an app can ask for. But still, Apple knows all. 8888 asked, that's just a fascinating subject. I think we're going to see some more court decisions on this. I have a feeling. I have a feeling maybe even the Supreme Court will end up ruling. Are, is that self-incrimination if they say, look into this phone and unlock it? Is it or isn't it? Leo Laporte, the tech guy. <laughs> Does this have anything to do with phone calls? Is this the same Vienna song? <laughs> it's Vienna calling? Is Vienna briefly. calling again? <laughs> I, I, you know, I know Vienna is a, is a beautiful place in Virginia, as well as, of course, uh, Austria. Uh, Mozart uh, played there. I'm going to be there for New Year's Eve in a couple of years. But I hate to say it, but when you say the word Vienna, I almost always want to say, yep. <laughs> yep. That's a sad thing. They may not even have anything to do with Vienna sausage, but for some reason... In my mind, you say Vienna, I say sausage. sausage. <laughs> Word association. Thank you, Armor. It's a thin parboiled sausage traditionally made of pork and beef in a casing of sheep's intestine. Ew, what? Ew. In a can, right? That's why they call it a Vienna sausage. Nice Vienna sausage is in Because you, if you said that, you wouldn't want one. I don't want one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in, in Austria, what do they call it? A Frankfurter Würstel. So uh, who should, now you've learned more than you ever cared to know. I about, I'm glad Chris isn't on today because we might be offending him. <laughs> wow, as they say. 
Vow. Who should I start with this fun Let's show? Let's go with? to Matthew in Newport Beach. Newport Beach, California. Thank you, Kim Schaffer, phone angel. Hello, Matthew Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Leo. How are you doing today? I am well. How are you? Pretty good. Pretty good. Um, so I have a, an issue. Um, I have the um, Kali 6 monitors uh, running Ableton software with the Volt audio interface. Holy cow. Um, Okay. And a, a Moog Subsequent 37 plugged into that as you well. You are a musician. You could play Vienna Calling right now. <laughs> you're set. Are you, I take it, you're, are you a professional musician or is this just a great setup for fun? This is just a setup for fun. Nice. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, so when I play, when I uh, open the DAW and I plug in, I use my Moog just, just as is, it sounds great. What other radio the show do you I... listen to where you might hear that sentence, when I open up the DAW and I play it on my Moog, it sounds great? You wouldn't hear that on any other show. But here, DAW is a digital audio workstation. It's what you edit music with. You plug it into your Moog, which is your, it's probably not a real Moog. It's a, it's a, it it's, it's a real Moog? It's one hundred percent real mode. Is it a vintage? Uh, no, it's it's their. They their still new make one. them. Uh, wow. Oh yeah, they still. That make was the original synthesizer, the Moog synthesizer. Wow, that's I cool. It. I love it. Yeah. So it's a it's an analog. Is it analog device that you plug it yeah. into? Okay. It is an analog. Yeah, but it has a MIDI um, interface. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, so the question is, when I, it sounds great to the Moog, but the moment I hit playback, I'm getting crackles, yeah. pops, and all type of robot noises. Yeah, that's a mismatch um, in the sample rate or the bit rate. Usually it's the sample rate. So if they have to have, you know, and when he, obviously if the sample rate's wrong, it's going to sound really funny. It's either going to sound sped up or it's going to crackle or weird things are going to happen. So somewhere along the line, and it's probably in the MIDI interface, which is supposed to set this all up, the wrong message got sent. It's, okay. Sometimes so, the oh. order that you turn these things on can fix this. Oh. Because what happens, remember, the Mavis is going to have a handshake with the computer. And the Mavis is going to say, all right, I'm going to send you 16-bit 24, 16-bit uh, 6, uh, 192 kilohertz audio or whatever. Uh, it's the clock is the problem, uh, and this clock rate. And then the computer goes, okay, got it, and I'll know how to play it back because I'm going to play it back at exactly that same sample rate, bit rate, and clock rate. I think that's what's happening is the handshake is not properly executing. Could be a bad MIDI cable. Could be, you know, something else like that. But try turning them on in a different order. Oh, my gosh. I, I have tried so many things, and no one ever even tried. To, no one's even mentioned that, that that would be an issue. Handshake is a very common issue in computing because when you turn on your TV, for instance, and your stereo, the HDMI cable, they have to do a little agreement. It's a little negotiation between them about what we're going to send and what you're going to receive, and I think that's what's going on. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Now, I could be completely wrong, but uh, which DAW are you using? You said Ableton? Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm. That's the first thing to look at. Does the um, is it a Mavis? Is that what you're using? No, a Volt. You're using the Volt. Does the Volt have a clock in it that it can sync with? Because that's the other problem is you could have a this clock could be out of sync. Um, n not that I'm aware of. Let me just add something. So I I have a, I'm running Windows 11. When I first had Windows 10, this wasn't an issue. Oh wow. Yeah, and I switched over Windows 11, yeah. and now this became an issue. So there, I don't. Is there a setup we, for MIDI in a configuration control panel? Yes, there is. Here we go. Is there on Windows 11? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe it's installed by Ableton. On a Mac, there is actually a, a system preference pane for MIDI that that would set all of this stuff. On the Windows, this is a PC. Yeah, I know. On Windows, I don't know, but. Uh, I don't think there is one built in. So many people make music on Macs that they build it in. But I bet you Ableton installs it. So you want to look at your MIDI control panel and just make sure it's set the same as the Moog is. Okay. And then sometimes you don't have to do that because, you know, in theory, these guys are going to go, hey, what what are you sending me? Well, I'm sending you this. Okay. I'll, you know. Sample eight. Yeah. Do you have that there? Uh, then yeah, look at no, they are the same. They're this, so the bit rate and the sample rate are the same. 
And then there's also a clock for synchronization that, that also could give you exactly what you just described is very, is a very common, uh, problem with, you know, interface, musical interfaces like this. They have to have the same bit rate, would, and clock rate and clock. Would, you, would it be possible it's a driver issue? Because when I play like yeah. music through just anything, yeah. would you recommend like an NVIDIA legacy driver? You think it's the NVIDIA, huh? I, I think oh, I've said, so I spent like two hours with the Sweetwater tech. Uh, he went through my uh, computer. He's done everything. I even bought a new audio interface, hoping that would be the issue, and it's still the issue. Huh. Yeah, I think, I, you know, by when you say you upgraded to Windows 11 and that caused it, it sounds very much to me that it's a driver. It's a software issue, not a hardware issue. There's something in uh, the MIDI clock is set wrong. It needs to be 24 uh, pulses per quarter note. <laughs> um there is a, uh, here's an article on sweet at sweetwater.com on how to sync MIDI devices. Uh, I will put that in the show notes because that might might have some additional information. You said you talked to Sweetwater? Yes. Yeah. They went all they're, through my they're good. I like Sweetwater. Yeah, they are. Um, yeah, they are. Because they put candy in the box. But uh, <laughs> uh, could be a different port might help. The uh, the the it's, which what, what kind of machine is it? Self built or? Oh, it's no, it's a uh, uh, HP Omen laptop. Omen, okay. So I don't know if the Omen has multiple. Um, probably not. Most laptops don't. But sometimes there's multiple uh, root hubs on a on the uh, USB, and and maybe one's messed up or uh, you know. So try different ports. Um, yeah, this is the kind of thing, this really sounds like a, uh, you're not using a yeah, hub, you're right? You're not, you're connecting direct. Yes. Okay. Cause that can affect this handshake as well. Well, there's some ideas if you, if you're interested and we've talked before, I know Matthew, if you're interested, the chat room, irc.twit.tv might have other ideas for you. They're, they're working on it too. They're using their collective minds. I have to run cause we, awesome. it's car time. Uh, what kind of music? EDM or what do you make? Uh, yeah, it's electronic. Nice, fun, Thank huh? You. What a great hobby! It is. All right, we'll it talk. We'll talk it. again. Let me know how it works out. All right, Sam. In front of a beautiful Detroit summer sky, all my friends. I love. I was back in Providence over the week, and uh, I love June. Back east, it's so gorgeous, so pretty. It is. We've got June gloom today. It won't get out of the 60s, and it's overcast, and it's just yicky. Oh, the sun's shining today. I know. It's 80 it's degrees out. Oh, so nice. Here we go. Time for Sam Abul Salmon, principal researcher at Guidehouse Insights. He's our motoring expert. Does a podcast called Wheel Bearings at wheelbearings.media. Love it when Sam comes in here and talks about cars. Hi, Sam. Hi, Leo. How are you this week? I'm great. What are you driving this week? Uh, I was originally scheduled to have a Cadillac CT5 Blackwing, uh, but the day before it was due to be delivered, got a note from the uh, fleet company saying, yeah, uh, it was damaged uh, in a previous loan and <laughs> we're still waiting on parts for it. So we're going to give you a Chevrolet Bolt EUV, Oh, uh, which is fine because I, I've been asking to get one of those uh, onto my schedule anyway. So The Bolts um, are the among the least expensive EVs, and we and, love our Chevy Bolt. We After the rebates and everything, it was twenty grand. And it's a yeah. great little car. My our, our son own is his car, and the UV is their like somewhat enlarged version of that. Yeah, it's it's about six inches longer, uh, yeah. a little bit longer, about three inch longer wheelbase, and about three inches off the back. Did you like um, it? Yeah, I, I still have it in my driveway. Uh, it's doing great. It's getting you know, it's very very energy efficient. It's got a range of uh, two hundred and forty seven miles. Oh, that's so nice. Range. So nice. Uh, so it's a little bit less than the regular Bolt because you know it's a little bit taller and heavier. But otherwise, uh, you know, largely the, the same driving experience. And it's actually, um, they about a month ago, GM announced that for the 2023 model year bolts, uh, which come out this summer, they were going to lower the price. So the current price on the, the regular bolt is, I think, about $32,000. And they're dropping it to about twenty six and a half. So it's going down by almost $6,000. And in fact, um, after they did that, they announced <clears throat> that, uh, anybody that has 
bought a Bolt or a Bolt EUV um, since they went back on sale in April or May after the after they stopped production for a while for, to deal with the recall um, is going to be getting a check back from GM for fifty nine hundred dollars. What uh, so, nice, yeah. So basically, they're they're retroactively repricing the 22 models to the same price as the upcoming 23s. I'm guessing so, this is kind of a strategic move more than, you know. Yeah, I, th I, I think it's a couple of things. Yeah. Uh, I, think, I think it is uh, strategic. <clears throat> you know, I mean, part part of it is you know, um, you know, there, there's probably some there was some reputational damage done to the car by right. recall right. Uh, but you know and and so they want to address that and making it cheaper but also next year uh, GM is bringing out an electric version of the equinox which is a slightly larger model which is their um, uh, their compact crossover that's their top it's the top selling Chevrolet vehicle after the the Silverado pickup uh, and they've promised that that one is going to have a starting price of thirty thousand wow. dollars so how did wait a minute now Ford says they lose money on the Mach-E's at 50000 How is GM selling these vehicles and making money? Are they making? Maybe they're losing money. Well, they never said they were making money. Oh. <laughs> so this is, I, this is to get a foothold in it, the industry. Yeah. As, as, well, especially right now, um, I suspect that GM is probably losing money on these bolts. Wow. Uh, I think, you know, uh, six or eight months ago, they were, they were probably breaking even on it. Now I'm... I'm pretty confident they're losing money because the price of key commodities for the batteries, the, the nickel, the, the cobalt, uh, the lithium, uh, all those prices have spiked over the last year. And so that is causing battery prices, which have been in a steady decline for the last decade, to go back up again. Yeah. Uh, so uh -huh. I, I and, th and that's the same reason why Ford has said that, you know, they've gone from making, you know, being profitable on the Mach-E to uh, be losing money on it. Uh, so, and, and we've already seen, you know, some other EVs, Tesla has raised their prices several times in the past six months. Uh, uh, for, uh, GM just announced a price increase for the Hummer EV of six thousand dollars. So basically, what they took off of the Bolt, they added to the <laughs> added to the Hummer, uh, and uh, and I, I expect we'll see more price increases on other EVs uh, in the coming months, uh, as long as these um, these metal prices continue to to stay high. It's still a it's just, saving it's for the consumer, especially with gas prices where they are. I would imagine. Oh, yeah. I mean, well, especially for you know for something like the the Bolt, you know, that you can get starting. At, Works out to about twenty six thousand five hundred dollars as yeah. the starting price. Yeah, it's amazing. That. Yeah, yeah. You know, now you got to pay for that, your electricity, uh, but uh, there are ways to. Yeah, but that's that. way cheaper than gas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, even even if you're even if you don't have solar, if you're, you know, if you're still getting electricity off the grid, um, I think current like off peak prices in California, I think are somewhere around sixteen or seventeen cents a kilowatt hour. Their battery um, must cost close to twenty six thousand dollars. Uh, <laughs> no, it's not it's not that bad. Because the, okay. the thing you gotta remember about the bolt um, is the you know the battery is relatively small because it's a, rel it's a, small you know, it's a relatively small yeah, car. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's only a 65 kilowatt hour battery. Right. Unlike the the one in the Hummer, which is uh, about 240 kilowatt hours. <laughs> it's bigger so than it's a, the, it's weighs about more a than the bolt. The size. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, you know, the the bolt the bolt battery probably costs about uh, somewhere around nine ten thousand dollars. Okay. Uh, maybe a little bit more right now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but. Yeah, I mean, if, if you're looking for afford an affordable EV, if you want to get into an EV and, and you want something that's not crazy expensive, uh, the Bolt is a fantastic option right now. It's a great car. Uh, also, the Hyundai Kona EV is another great option. Um, that one has a starting price of $34,000. And Hyundai is still eligible for federal tax credits of $7,500. So it works out to be roughly the same price as the Bolt. Um, and uh, the, the GM is no longer eligible for the tax credits, the federal tax credits, because they, several years ago, they hit the 200,000 sales mark. So GM and Tesla are already uh, phased out of tax credits. Um, as of this quarter uh, that just ended, Toyota also hit the 200,000 sales mark for plug-in vehicles. So they're um, uh, starting in October, they're going to start their phase out uh, for their EVs. Um, and probably, probably by the end of the third quarter, 
um, Ford, uh, end of the third quarter, maybe into the fourth quarter, Ford will hit that 200,000 mark as well. So um, it's unless unless Congress, um, you know, gets its act together and, and starts expanding these uh, incentives again, um, th- those prices are going to start to go up as well. Uh, because uh, you know you're not going to have that option for for some of those tax incentives anymore. Yeah. 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 What do you think the chances are that they will extend those incentives? Uh, I think as long as they are, uh, they have the current balance of power in there, and Joe Nothing. Manchin is the senator zero. from West Virginia. Uh, zero. Yeah. In fact, if, uh, or, if or Joe perhaps, Manchin perhaps could slightly make, less than zero, if he could get cars to run on coal, he would. So uh, yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, that's that's not I. I I sincerely doubt that's going to happen, unfortunately, um, because you know that is the probably the single biggest stumbling block to people adopting EVs is is the cost. Well, and you uh, could argue that the subsidy. I don't know. You could argue on the one hand it's good for the country to move to EVs. You know, I could argue on the other hand that it's spending money we don't really have. I I'm not sure where I sit on that fence. And, yeah. Well, I mean, I've always thought the way the the current incentive system is set up is flawed anyway. Yeah. Uh, because it. You know, basically, most of the people who've gotten those incentives are more affluent people that yeah, can afford early Teslas adopters. and yeah. <laughs> and, and, yeah. and and other high end like vehicles yeah. who who arguably don't really need that money. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's it's people who would normally buy something like a Toyota Corolla um, or a Chevy Cruze. They're the ones you know at the lower end of the market that who really need should that, be that break. I agree. Yeah, yeah. yeah we've think, we've bought you know, four. If, EVs, all of which we got the $7,500 federal tax break plus California breaks, which made them yeah. very much you know, more I think, affordable. I think that there yeah. should be a, an income cap and also a price cap on the vehicle. Hush so, your you know, mouth. Not, nothing over $45,000 gets an incentive. No, I, I yeah. completely agree with you. you, you know, yeah. We should subsidize it for the people who can ill afford the EVs. Sam yeah. Abul Samet, Principal Researcher, Guidehouse Insights. He uh, podcasts at wheelbearings.media. And he's always a welcome guest here on the Tech Guy Show. 8888-ASK-LEO is my phone number this 4th of July weekend. Be a good time to call. Calls are pretty slow yesterday. Give yourself a chance to get in right now. More of your calls coming up. Yeah, we bought, we must have bought the bolt right at the end of the subsidies. Yeah, I think I think uh, you got yours in 2020 or 20- 2019, I think. 2019. Oh, well, yeah. It might have been a 2020 was- model in 2019, but I think we got it in 2019, yeah. 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 So, uh, yeah, you were, you were you were right around the Just about where, the end. where they hit that 200,000 yeah. mark. Lisa's so, yeah, also like a hell of a negotiator. She really got the guy down <laughs> like a yeah. lot. But I mean, you know, now you know you can get one, you know, out the door. I mean, less taxes and you know, and other fees and stuff. But you know, twenty starting at twenty six and a half grand, which is a pretty decent price, you know, yeah. for for a brand new car. Yeah. And it's it's a really good car. Yeah. You know, I mean, it gets great range. It's you know, it's comfortable to drive. Uh, it's surprisingly roomy for its size. It's very well packaged. Um, so you know, I think it's a great option for a lot of people. And you know the. The the Kona is also a great car. Um, Roberto Baldwin, uh, my my wheel bearings co host, uh, he and his wife have a Kona EV, ah. um, and uh, it's you know it's also a, a you know fantastic little yeah, EV. <clears throat> you know, it's great for great for city driving. You know, both of them because they're comparatively small, they're easy to park. You know, easy to maneuver around in cities. They're they're surprisingly quick. Uh, Two hundred horsepower and you know lots of instant torque. So they're actually um, actually really you know really good to drive. So uh, I saw an Ionic uh, yesterday. Those look beautiful too. Yeah, there's some nice uh, uh, EVs out there. Yeah, there, there's a lot of new yeah. EVs coming. Yeah. Um, you know, as of last fall, there were 20 EV nameplates available for sale wow. in the U.S. Uh, by this year, by the end of this year, that number should be somewhere around 45. I and, saw that Ford is stopping lease buybacks now. So yeah. I'm still, I was grandfathered in because mine's pretty old. So if I decide to buy it at the end of the lease, uh, I can. But I think anybody buys leases now, you're, you're going to have to this, it Well, this is something Tesla has been doing for a while. They, is it because they're so valuable in, in the used market that they just don't want to let you buy it back? Um, yeah, it, it's it's a couple of things. Yeah, they, they want to make sure that they can get um, inventory for their ah, dealers of to course. sell of yep. used cars. Yep. Um, and... Um, yeah, you know, they figure they can get a get a better deal. You know, selling it that way, uh, they can they can make more money on right. it. Plus, also, I think that in general, there 
is going to be a shift uh, over the, the coming years to the manufacturers wanting to retain some degree of control over the vehicles over their lifespan um, so that at the end of life of the vehicle, they can take back that battery yeah. and recycle the battery right. or repurpose it for storage right. applications, things right. like that. Right. So they, they, they see a lot of... Um, Upside. Uh, up, yeah, a lot of lifetime value yeah. in that battery. And well, maybe I should keep my Mach E. <laughs> I mean, maybe yeah. I will buy it out. I don't know what the buy. Well, you know, and you know, as it turns out, let's see, yours will be up. Uh, what next year? Twenty five or twenty five? Okay. Um, yeah. By then, you know, hopefully the inventory situation will be better. Um, Is but, that right? You know, I mean, 22? if you're no twenty four, I've got two more yeah. years in the lease. You're right. Okay. You were right. February twenty four. Yeah, so hopefully the inventory situation by then will be will be better. Yeah. Um, but you know, right now, you know, if you have a vehicle that you're leasing that you know is coming up on the end of the lease, unless you've already ordered something to replace it, um, you might be in a better situation. And actually, even if you have something lined up already to replace your lease vehicle, if you if you can afford to buy it buy it out at the end of the lease. You're probably in a, it's the 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 numbers will probably work out that it's actually to your advantage to buy it right now and then just turn around and sell it because you can probably wow. make a profit on that. Holy because cow. the residual value is probably that was calculated you know two three years ago. It's turning it's probably less than what down. it's worth on the open yeah, market right yeah. now. Yeah. Can you stick around for the top? Yep. All right. We'll talk in a few. All Thank right. you, Sam. Yeah, let's play some Fourth of July music. That's a great idea. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Born in the USA, 8888-ASK-LEO, the phone number, 888-827-5536. Toll free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada. Let's go to Diamond Bar next. Karen is on the line. Hi, Karen. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. I am very sensitive to Wi-Fi, and I, I need to have a phone that has an uh, ear jack. I would like one that has an... Uh, uh, card for storage, like an SD card, and I also need to stay with the 4G. Can you give me some suggestions there, antiques? Or well, I all phones have Wi-Fi. Uh, you can you can turn it off, obviously. So uh, if that's sufficient for you, headsets, headsets. I can't do the, you know, the. Well, let me tell you something about that. Um, yeah, sometimes people say, well, I don't want to use Bluetooth headsets because of the radio waves. But if you plug in headphones, you're actually just putting an antenna in the phone and powering it right up into your ears. There's more RF coming through the headphones that are wired than unwired. What about the there are earphones that are they have a like a canal in them? They're not filled. They're like uh, clear. Have you heard oh of yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, that's just air. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we. That yeah, they they don't sound quite as good, but yeah, they yeah you could do that. That's an interest. You need so well, the way those work is somewhere along the line in the headphone, there'll be a little transmitter box. So you plug it into the phone, there'll be a little transmitter box that then makes the sound. It's like a little speaker that then goes through an air tube into your ear. That's very common. That's what uh, the TV anchors are wearing those. They have uh, hollow tubes going into their ear. Uh, okay. More of those for years. It's fine. Um, I don't know if anybody makes hollow tube headphones for uh, cell phones, though. That's interesting. So let me let's let's start with uh, getting the phone. You probably want a phone with a headphone jack, because yeah. at least that will give you a way of you know that's going to require a headphone jack. I'm going to guess. Okay. Um, and the more and more phones are uh, eliminating headphone jacks, but there are a few. You know, they've just not given up. I actually like it. I prefer a headphone jack. So Motorola's phones still, some of them still have headphone jacks. And actually, I really like these. They're called the Motos, M-O-T-O's. The, the Moto G is very good. Um, and they come up every year. They update it. So I think it's the G9 currently. And I think the current, you should check, obviously, before you buy. But some of the older Moto, I know the older ones do. There is a Google phone that still has a headphone jack, not the current uh, Pixel 6 or, or the upcoming 6A, but the 5A is quite a nice phone. It's under $500, water resistant, still has a headphone jack. But you said you want a micro SD card slot too, didn't you? Yes, yes. Yeah, those are disappearing as fast, or if not faster, yeah. than headphone jacks. 
It, if, I use it for lectures and things like that. It's an MP3 player. These are, these are recorded. So you record them onto the uh, SD card, and then you could pop it and put it in somewhere else and play it back, yeah. huh? Correct. Yeah. Ah, so what we now want is a phone that has a headphone jack and an SD card slot. And isn't 5G. Yeah, all of them. Oh, it is not 5G. It's only LTE. Oh, boy, we really... You're going to have to go back in time. Uh, fortunately, a lot of older phones don't have 5G, and they're still being sold. I would say probably the Motorola. I'm trying to think if um, the Motorola has SD card slots, though. Boy, you, you came up with a good one. You know, there really needs to be a site where you could enter in all these specs, and yeah. it would narrow it all down. Wouldn't that be cool? Yes, it would be. Yes. <coughs> then you could do like a little calculator and say what you need. Uh, the the one I go to for this is GSM Arena. And okay. uh, I think that they do have something like that. You certainly can see all the specs of all the phones. And they will tell you phone by phone. I would look at the Motos. Okay. Um, the Moto G Stylus has, is 4G, has a headphone jack. I can't, I'm not sure if it has a, <laughs> this is hysterical. I'm not sure if it has a SD card. We need a little uh, comparison selector. Here we go. Let's see. I'm on GSM Arena right now. Um, I, I think these are very nice phones. And they, yeah, fortunately, Motorola still sells plenty of phones because they sell kind of mid, mid to low price phones. So they sell plenty of phones without 5G in them. Mm. Yeah. So I think there's some good choices. Why don't you go to GSM Arena and you can... Uh, it's a lot easier than trying to uh, trying to do it at a, a store because the stores won't have as many choices, and then you'll be able to pick the one you uh, you want that has the things you want in it. Let me look and see if I can see if the 2022 Stylus 4G has a headphone jack. It does have a headphone jack. Now, does it have? Yes, it has a card slot. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we have a winner, winner, chicken dinner. The Moto G Stylus for 2022. No 5G, headphone jack. These are pretty good phones. Great batteries, 5,000 milliamp batteries. And it does support an SD card, which means you could record and put it on the SD cards. So I think we have, I think we have a winner, thanks to GSM Arena. I've narrowed it down. $279 on Amazon. That's another thing that's great about it. Uh, Motorola, these motos are very, very affordable. I hope we've helped you, Karen. I, I would, without hesitation, recommend that. The Moto G Stylus from 2022. David's on the line. He's next from uh, Tahunga, California. Hi, David. Yep. Hi. Howdy. I am, uh, how are you? I'm uh, feeling well myself. Are you, uh, are you yeah, troubled by some technology that I can help you with? Yeah, I, uh, I'm having trouble tuning television frequencies. And I wonder, you said something about uh, television going... Yeah, they've moved out. everything. <laughs> yeah, I know. They it. <laughs> so, do you have a TV? So, you've got an antenna, I, I presume. That's why it's... I have, yeah, I have a couple of antennas. Okay. Do you, what you need is a TV that will scan all the frequencies and find the channels. That's the easiest thing to do. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not having trouble with that, but when I get one channel, I lose another one. Yeah. So, because my antenna rotates. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so I'm going to point you to a couple of sites that will help you uh, with this. One's called TV Fool. At TV Fool. TV Fool. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, which is a site that will, you enter in your address or your zip code, and it will tell you where the towers are that you're aiming at. And it will also help you choose an antenna that will hit all the towers that are near to you. Well, I was wondering, are they reducing the, uh, the wattage? Are they reducing? They the may be. Power? They may be. I mean, that's going to be on a. St I, that's not mandated. That's not required. They did have to. You know, remember we had the digital to, uh, analog to digital conversion. That was problem number one for your analog uh, TV antenna. Um, that was some years ago. Remember the FCC was offering you cheap digital converters and all that. That we went through that a few years ago. But 
currently ongoing is they're moving some of the frequencies. Almost all the uh, TVs are doing this. And, and if you're watching local stations over the air, you'll see periodically an announcement, rescan because we're going to be moving channel 7 to a slightly different frequency. So things will disappear. OTA, over-the-air TV, is the best deal in television. It's the least compressed the highest quality, if you get ATSC 3.0, you might even get some 4K, but you'll certainly get very good HD on modern broadcast channels. But the thing is to get the right antenna. So tvfool.com is a great place to start to see which stations you can get, where they are, and even get some antenna advice. Another one for antenna advice is Antenna Web. So it's tvfool.com, which, by the way, every time I talk about it, it goes down because they don't have a very powerful server. So if, if, it's, <laughs> if you go there and say, it's not working, come back in ten, you know, half an hour, it'll probably be all right. All the people in the radio show are now going there now. So tvfool.com and antennaweb.org. They also have a location thing. And their, their goal is, again, not only to help you find the channels, but what antennas will help with this. And you could probably find an antenna that will get everything. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Yeah, that's a good, a very good point. They may not be weaker, but they're digital, so there is a cliff that they, you know, when you when the signal instead of degrading, instead of ghosting, you know, remember the old days of TV where it ghosts and you get weird, weird patterns and stuff. It doesn't do that anymore. It just stops working. It just goes boom. Johnny. Uh, you know, we love to do the show until on radio. Okay, hey uh, Sam, go ahead. It's all yours here. Okay. Uh, all right, so we got a bunch of uh, questions in the chat uh, I'm going to try and go through. Um, I'll start off with the Honda HRV, the new HRV, um, which uh, they just had a uh, media drive program for that a couple of weeks ago. I did not get a chance to, to go on that, so I haven't driven it yet. One of my uh, podcast co hosts, Nicole Wakeland, did drive it. The new HRV is quite a bit larger than the old one. Uh, it's now based on the Civic platform instead of the, uh, the Cadillac. Uh, or instead of the Honda Fit, um, and uh, it's more powerful than before. It's roomier. Um, it's a little less uh, interesting looking. It's a little little blander looking, um, but uh, you know it should be a really good vehicle. Uh, you know it's a Honda that you know their stuff is always really good. Um, uh, you know I put my own money down on a Honda. We we bought one a couple of years a few years ago. Um, the uh, Cadillac Lyric, uh, I think uh, some, uh, let's see, RCB is me, uh, has uh, asked multiple times in here, will I comment on the Lyric? Yeah, uh, so I did I did drive the Lyric a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it's it's an excellent vehicle. It's uh, I like the comment one of my friends made. It's the best electric Cadillac ever built. Um, it's also the first electric Cadillac, but that's beside the point. Uh, no, it's it's actually really good. Uh, it's It looks great. Uh, really nicely done interior, interior nicely executed interior. Um, beautiful 33-inch uh, uh, curved uh, LCD display across the the dashboard with the the instrument cluster the and um, the infotainment system. Um, it's it's very roomy. Uh, drives drives really well. Uh, I'll I'll find I'll drop the uh, link to uh, my review from Forbes in the chat. Um, the only issue I had with it uh, was at the time that I drove it. Um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, there were still quite a few software bugs that they were still ironing out, um, and they were uh, they had apparently two OTA updates already lined up to go. I actually ran into uh, a GM executive, Don Nicholson, Dan Nicholson, yesterday at a Cars and Coffee event. I was chatting with him about it, and he said uh, they've already pushed out one of those OTA updates to the cars that have been built, the lyrics that have been built, uh, and they're going to start shipping lyrics to customers in the next week or two uh and they should have the second ota in there as well uh to fix some of those software bugs but overall uh really excellent uh luxury electric crossover so if you're if you're looking for something uh you know in that kind of mid-size crossover segment uh in a you know premium vehicle uh, i would definitely recommend taking a look at that although the 2023 model year is all sold out um, they're going to start production of 24 models late in Q1 of next year. 
of 2023 uh, and start shipping those early in, in quarter two, so March or April time frame. Uh, and they're taking orders for those now. So if you're if you're interested in one, you'll want to get your get your order in soon uh, before those are sold out as well. Uh, what else we had here? Uh, somebody <clears throat> had a comment about uh, Kia uh, charging dealer premiums. Uh, it's important to keep in mind that uh, in the U.S., uh, uh, for established automakers uh, that aren't startups like Tesla, uh, that have dealers, that have franchise dealers, those dealers are independent businesses. They are not owned by the manufacturers. And the way the system works is the, the manufacturer sells the cars to the dealer, and then the dealer sells the cars onto customers. Uh, and there are laws in many states that, in fact, explicitly prohibit manufacturers from uh, selling direct to consumers, which I think is highly problematic. But you know, when, uh, when car dealers have been very successful over the last century, uh, they've managed to buy a lot of politicians that have put laws in place to protect their financial interests. Um, so it's the, these independent dealers that are charging the premiums. And you know, this is a byproduct of capitalism. When you have a supply and demand situation where there's not enough supply and more de- too much demand, uh, prices are going to go up. And you know, dealers are, unfortunately, a lot of dealers, not all of them, there are some that, that don't charge uh, dealer markups, but um, some of them, um, you know, do. And that's, you know, the individual dealers making that choice to mark it up. And, you know, the same is true, you know, when we have the opposite situation, when uh, consumer demand is down and there's too many cars on the lot waiting to be sold. That's when you get discounts. You know, so it works both ways. You know, um, when when there's more more inventory, then customers can go in and negotiate the price down from the the, the manufacturer's suggested list. When there's not enough supply, it goes the other way around. Uh, so if you know if a dealer is looking to charge you a huge markup over the, the sticker price in the car, go find another dealer. There's there's lots of other dealers around. You know, and just walk away uh, unless you absolutely must have that car right now, that that specific vehicle. But definitely, um, you know, uh, go go shop around. Um, see, uh, comp- uh, let's see, will the Lyric come with the newest version of Super Cruise? Yes, it will. Although it won't, the Super Cruise won't be enabled on there until uh, later in the fall, uh, because right now uh, one of the things they did on the Lyric is they moved to an all-new compute platform. It's based on the Qualcomm Snapdragon Ride platform, uh, and so uh, GM has had to rewrite a lot of the software to work on this on this new compute architecture, uh, and they're still working on that. They want to make sure that's 100% right before they before they ship that. Um, actually, the the Chevy Bolt EUV that I'm driving right now also has Super Cruise on it, and it works really well as a hands-free system. It actually works better than than Ford's Blue Cruise uh, system that was on the F-150 Lightning I was driving a couple of weeks ago. Um, is it true that Mercedes-Benz is getting out of the entry-level uh, car market and focusing on more premium luxury cars? So yeah, um, at least here in North America, uh, they've been discontinuing some of the smaller, uh, some of the, the, the cheaper cars in their lineup. Or, you know, no, no Mercedes-Benz is cheap. But, you know, th- things like the CLA uh, and some of the other smaller vehicles that they've had, uh, again, you know, this goes back to what we're seeing from a lot of other manufactururs where sales on those vehicles uh, has been have been declining over the last several years. And so they're going to focus on, you know, the cars that consumers actually seem to want to buy. Uh, so, you know, in this case, you know, we'll we'll see them continue to sell cars like the the GLB and crossover and the GLC crossover. Uh, you know, at the smaller end of their lineup, uh, but um, uh, you know, just as as every other manufacturer is doing, when they have a limited supply of things like chips that they can that they can use to build vehicles, they're going to go for the ones uh, generally that you know they can make the most profit off of. I mean, it's just it's. That's business. It's just the way business works. Um, it, how is the U.S. infrastructure on recharging stations or EV repair service stations? Um, so uh, it's going to it's getting better. 
there's more charging stations, public charging infrastructure being put in all the time. Uh, the infrastructure bill that was passed earlier this year, uh, they are currently in, in the process of uh, rolling out the that program to give those grants, that $7.5 billion that was set aside for charging infrastructure. That should fund about 500,000 new public charging stations. Um, and they, a couple of weeks ago, they announced some of the rules around that um, requiring that uh, the chargers that are that are installed with this money uh, be accessible to everyone. They can't be limited or specific to any particular brand. It needs to be accessible to anyone that wants to use them. Uh, there are rules as far as uh, uptime requirements because that's been one of the problems uh, with the uh, a lot of the current chargers is a lack of reliability. Uh, so any company that wants to get some of this federal money is going to have to guarantee uh, something like 99% uptime for the chargers. Uh, so it, it will get better in the coming years. And especially as there are more people driving EVs, more people utilizing the chargers. So, the, so they're actually generating revenue. And one of the problems up until now is there were, there were more chargers than EVs or, you know, relative to the number of EVs. So we're, we had an oversupply of chargers uh, and they, they didn't get enough utilization and they weren't generating enough revenue to pay for the repair and upkeep of those chargers. So hopefully that'll Sam, you the man. Thank you so much. Really My appreciate pleasure, it. Leo. Have a wonderful week. Enjoy uh, yeah. a beautiful Michigan summer. I uh, will talk to you next week. All right. Thank you, sir. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smart watches, you know, that kind of thing. Technology, 8888-ASK-LEO, the phone number, 888-827-5536, toll free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada, outside that area, you can uh, still call us, 8888-ASK-LEO. We had a uh, caller, uh, last call of the hour. Very worried about wireless um, interference with her biological self. I'm not going to mock that. I don't think it's a problem. I don't think there's any evidence that it is. I know there's no evidence uh, that it is. Although, oddly, uh, the World Health Organization at one point a couple of years ago said, even though there is no evidence that uh, interf you know radio frequency from a phone will harm you in any way, even though there is no evidence... Uh, it's not, it's what, not what they call ionizing radiation, the kind of uh, radiation that would be harmful to human cells. Even though there is no evidence, prudence would dictate you don't carry the phone in your person and you don't hold it to your head and all that stuff. I thought that was kind of a strange recommendation. Here we are a couple of years later, still no evidence, lots of evidence to the contrary. We've had cell phones now, we've been holding them to our ear for 20, maybe 30 years no increase in brain cancers or anything like that. So I don't think there's a lot. And certainly 5G is no worse or better, still non-ionizing. Uh, I, I, there are a lot of conspiracy theories about 5G, but uh, there's no reason to, to fear it. Uh, she did want headphones that didn't have a wire in them. Uh, so she could listen to the phone without... Uh, now, and I did point out that... Uh, and, uh, you know... Studies maybe are a little mixed on this, but wired headphones are not better than wireless headphones. They are not because you're effectively attaching a, a, a wire to a device that is radiating, you know, radio emissions, and then putting the wire, other end of the wire, in your ear. So it's actually radio frequencies going right up that wire into your ear. So she said, "Well, what about wireless?" And there are, in fact, we use them. We've used them for years in television. Uh, tubes, acoustic audio tube headphones. In fact, I put a link in the show notes to Otto, which is the brand we use uh, here, O-T-T-O. Uh, they have a 3.5 millimeter jack on one end, and uh, on, and then kind of halfway up the end, they have a little, basically, a loudspeaker. It's tiny, but it takes the electrical impulses and uh, turns them into sound, which then travel up a hollow tube into your ear. So it's like you've got a little, the speaker's down there instead of, you know, on the headphone which means there's no wire going into it. And I guess if, if you know, you were to accept the premise, faulty though it may be, that the uh, radio interference is bad for you. Um, and I know a lot of people, they'll just say, well, Leo's a shill for the industry and clearly it's bad for you. How could it not be bad for you? 
you know, modern life is probably bad for us, but it's modern life and we're moderns. So there's no evidence that's bad for you. Anyway, you could do this. There is a drawback to doing this, though. These are listen only. They don't have a microphone in them. Uh, maybe I could find one that does. There's no reason you couldn't put a microphone where that speaker is. Still have a hollow tube to your ear, but the microphone would be down there. They just don't, I don't think they make them because, maybe they do, but I haven't found one because, uh, you know, generally these are used in television where you have a microphone on your <laughs> on your lapel or whatever. Somebody yeah. probably makes hollow tube with a microphone. Um, maybe for uh, police, right? Here's a, the decibels custom molded security radio surveillance earpiece set. Same thing, hollow tubes. Thermo fit designed for clear acoustic tube radios. Oh, these are just the earpieces. Well, anyway, we'll keep looking. See, I aim to please. I'm not, I, you know, if, if you're worried about that, that's fine. I don't, I don't want you to expose something, yourself to something you think is a health hazard. I just am pointing out that there's no evidence that it is. But if you think there is, fine, protect yourself. That's fine. I carry my phone right here, my, my chest pocket, and I put it up to my head. <laughs> and I listen to it and all that. And I have little earbuds, little radios. They're transmitting. You really want to get scared? Some of the earbuds that you, know, that you put in your ear, like the Google earbuds... Uh, they connect. The, there's one earbud that connects to the phone. The other earbud connects to the, the the first earbud. How does it do that? Through your brain. There's no wire, but if it's through your brain, it transmits through your head. So your left ear is pairing to the phone. Your right ear is not pairing to the phone. It's pairing to the left ear. I think the shortest point between the left ear and the right ear is your brain. Now I'm scaring you. Mary, uh, Marty is on the line from Kalapana, Hawaii. Kalapana, Ana, Hala, Hala, Hawa. Hello, Marty. Where's which which island is Kalapana? Which island is Kalapana on? On the Big Island. The Big Island. I'm so jealous. Beautiful, beautiful. Which side? The south side um, of the Big Island. Is that the wet side? Yes, the the wet the. Uh, the poor side, whatever you want to call it. The poor side, wet side, <laughs> best side. side. How about we call it the best side? It is the best. Let side. those rich people stay in the dry side. I'm going to the best side. <laughs> there you go. Um, so I'm uh, sitting here with the phone next to my head. I hope I'll be okay. <laughs> um, you know, if you if you're gonna go, at least you're gonna go in paradise. Well, hopefully. So uh, here's my question. The um, many, as you know, many websites you go to have these uh, little messages uh, somewhere uh, about cookies. Yeah. And this particular one says uh, this site uses cookies, so now you know. And that's this is that's my TV. site. Says that. Yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, that's me being passive aggressive, by the way. <laughs> Casting no aspersions on you, how do I know that when I see these warnings that they aren't put in the uh, in the uh, browser window by a bad guy? And when you click on accept or well, any okay. button you click, if there's a bad guy there, anything you do could be bad. Those, you know, that's a good point. Um, sites are required. By the, it's not even by, it's not American regulation. It's a European regulation uh, that predates the GDPR, the the General Data Protection Regulation uh, from Europe for privacy. It it, in my opinion, the reason I'm passive aggressive about it is it's nonsense. It's nonsense, and the regulators who pass that law in the EU and enforce it are ju are just wasting our time. Every time we go to a website, there's another cookie banner. But you have to do it. The fines are huge. The cookies, what cookies are, same thing, you know, when you're using a, a program and you save the settings, you have to save settings when you're using software. Otherwise, every time you went to Facebook, you'd have to log in. Otherwise, every time you went to your Gmail, you'd have to log in and tell it what folder you're in and all that stuff. Cookies are your settings. They're saved on your hard drive. They are not inherently bad for you, 
when they were designed, and they were designed by Mozilla uh, when they first came out with Netscape, they were designed uh, with privacy in mind, believe it or not. The cookies are designed in such a way that only the site that set the cookie can read it. So I go to Starbucks and save my favorite Frappuccino half-calf decaf with a twist. Starbucks remembers that, but when I go uh, over to Dunkin', they can't see that Starbucks cookie because it's not theirs. It's Starbucks. So that protects your privacy. But, you know, these uh, these sites, they love to spy on you and they, you know, because advertisers want this information. So sites figured out a way around it with something called third-party cookies. If I go, and you've seen this, if you go to a site that has the Facebook like button, you know, thumbs up, why do you think Facebook did that? They did that because now Facebook is on that page and can set a cookie. Facebook now knows you went to Starbucks. And by the way, if you then go to Dunkin' and there's a Facebook like button, they know you went to Dunkin'. They can read their own cookies. They still can't read the Starbucks or the Dunkin' cookies, but they still know you went to those sites. They can track you around the web. Uh, Facebook knows everything. And, and, of course, it was Facebook that invented this. But now everywhere you go, there are sign-on cookies from a Google, Facebook, Microsoft, Apple. And all of that, because it's just a little bit of code from those websites embedded on the Starbucks site, all of the... And I shouldn't blame Starbucks because, you know, anywhere you see these, all of those are there to track you. So everywhere there's a like button, Facebook knows I've you visited that site. So those are called third-party cookies. And those are, a pro obviously, they're a privacy problem. All modern browsers have a switch, block third-party cookies. Unfortunately, the EU decided because of this, all cookies are bad. They're not. They're necessary. And most sites, for instance, my personal website, I use a cookie for one thing only. You could set it to light mode or dark mode. And I, as a convenience to you, the visitor, would like to remember that so the next time you visit, it could be in light mode or dark mode. Am I invading your privacy by doing that? No. I'm helping. I'm helping. And I don't have a Facebook button on there or anything else. But I still have to put a banner that says, yeah, I use a cookie. So what I'm at, on that side, the banner says, I use a cookie for your light and dark settings. And, and then there's a little loophole because... You don't have to do anything about it. Just say, okay, I have to let you know I'm using cookies. It is the biggest single waste of time in the world. Billions of clicks a day for no good reason. It does nothing. It saves you nothing. <laughs> it's just annoyance. And so I'm a little passive aggressive on our website. Yeah, like most other sites, very few sites don't use cookies. We use cookies. I almost, I, I used to, I, for a while I said get over it. But then I decided not to be so mean. Uh, you don't have to worry. There's not that's not malware. Clicking a button, look, clicking a button is is you know potentially risky anywhere, but it's not going to do anything. What you want to watch out for is if there were a banner that says, "Yeah, we use cookies. Give me your name, address, phone number, and credit card number, and I'll make sure you don't see this again." That would be a problem because yeah, you don't know where that came from. And the way the web is designed, it's possible to embed third party stuff, you know, on the web, and that's bad guys take advantage of that. But I, do not fear. Uh, you are safe. You're certainly safe on my site. <laughs> it's a good question, though. Why do we I'm see these everywhere? About your site. I know other sites. I, I'm worried that that some nefarious site we use the same message, but the uh, when you click on OK, it will do something worse. Yeah, like nothing. They can't, can't really do anything with OK that they couldn't do without OK. In other words, that OK button is connected to some programming code called JavaScript. That JavaScript can run whether you press OK or not. So if a site's hacked, it's hacked. You know, they don't need a button. You're not giving them permission to do anything. It's, it's fine. If it's hacked, it's hacked. doesn't matter if there's a button. They can do whatever they want. So do not worry. Click the button if you want. Some sites, better than me, have a whole lot. They've spent a, month, a lot of money on code where you could say what kind of cookies we can use and all that. I'm not required to do it, so I don't. I think that's ridiculous. It's absurd. But it's a great... I'm really glad you asked. Um, now you can put the phone down. You don't have to keep it next to your head, but I'm glad you asked, Marty. Uh, but no, no nothing, nothing more harmful cooking, clicking the button than if you didn't click the button. That is not a risky thing to do. Clicking a link, going to another page, risky. Uh... Downloading something, risky. 
filling out a form that says it's your bank, but it's not with your password, risky. But clicking a button is harmless. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. More calls right after this. 8888, ask Leo. I put this, I know that because I put this song in a 4th of July playlist that I made some years ago for a party. I used to be the guy, you know, because I knew how... Uh, I knew how iTunes worked to make the playlist. I put this in and somebody said, you know, the line is American woman, get away from me. It's probably not the most patriotic song ever. Okay, fine. I like it still. It's a good song. 8888 Ask Leo. Uh, we are uh, playing 4th of July music. I hope you're having a good 4th of July weekend. Our uh, little town, uh, which can always barely afford the fireworks every year in Petaluma, California, there's a notice in the newspaper, well, we don't think we have enough money to do the fireworks. They're only going to be two two minutes this year. Or, And then somebody comes along and says, I'll give you some money. And they do it last minute. This year, they were going to have fireworks. They said, well, because of the drought and the fire hazard, and because we're broke, no fireworks. Everybody went, aw. And then they announced, we're going to have a laser light show instead. Oh, okay. Uh and we're going to project it against the mountain. So everybody who can see Sonoma Mountain from here will see the light show. So I don't know what that's going to be like. Have you seen the drone shows? Those are wild. The, I, they, maybe they cost more. They probably do cost more than fireworks. But boy, those are great, what they can do with those drones. They have fleets of hundreds of drones that, that can, are coordinated to fly together and make American flags that wave and all sorts of things. If you go to YouTube and look for drone shows, you'll you'll see some of these. Unbelievable. And I would bet that, I don't know, we love our fireworks, don't we? But I think a lot of, for fire reasons and others, a lot of uh, communities are doing drone shows tomorrow. You know, do an American Eagle, a waving flag, that kind of thing. 8888 Ask Leo, the phone number. Our website, techguylabs.com. I put that there. Uh, it's changed a little bit if you used it in the past. The server, uh, the site we were uh, we had, the old site, was running on a content management system. That's the software on the site that was uh, getting old and was going to be insecure next year. And when we went to uh, the company that serves it for us and said, well, how much to update it to the new version of Drupal? That's the content management system we use. They said, it'll be a quarter of a million dollars, please. And I said, <laughs> um, so we decided not to do that. We actually have two sites. My podcast network has a site, twit.tv, also running Drupal. We're going to have to pay a quarter of a million dollars to fix that site. I didn't want to pay half a million for two sites. So we merged the two. So techguylabs.com has now moved over. You still go to the same place. Through the magic of the internet, type techguylabs.com. It'll take you to twit.tv. It'll take you to the Tech Guy shows. You'll see all the shows there. We put audio and video from the shows up after the fact. We have a podcast, too. You can subscribe to the podcast there. But we'll also put... It doesn't have as much of the stuff that we had in the old site, but it does have, I think, what you need, which is links. In fact, we're going to put some links to uh, tube headphones you can use on your phone that do have a microphone. Auto and some other companies offer those. So we'll put links up there. Uh, we put a transcript after the fact. Computer does it. We go through it, make sure it's accurate. Put that up there. And also uh, links to the music will be up there. It's episode 1908. And it'll all be free and open and easy to use. TechGuyLabs.com. Leo Laporte, the Tech Guy. Leo Laporte, the Tech Guy. You see the problem here? Musical director Laura. You start that song. I want to hear the whole thing. I want to hear the whole thing. And then you gotta then you gotta Google it on Wikipedia and you gotta get what every verse means. And it's an afternoon shot. So maybe we should just stop right now. Marty on the line. Oh, that was Marty. Now that was Marty in uh in uh Kalapana. Oh, lucky guy. Now it's our friend Kelvin, the deaf blind potter on the line. Hello, Kelvin. Hey man, how you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? Good. It's the best day of my life. Yesterday's not here. Tomorrow's not here. We're right here today, right? You are such an inspiration. I love you, Kelvin. Always love hearing from you. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I have a question, and it's going to be a little bit different than most of my calls because I'm always dealing with live issues or video things. You stream. We should say for people who don't know, you stream live on Twitch while you're making pottery. People can watch you do it. It's and you've got a big old setup. 
that uh, we've talked about before. Really cool stuff. Yes. The, uh, at all, all of it is at deafblindpotter.com. Deafblindpotter.com. So I wanted to ask you a question, um, and I don't know if you'll know this answer because it's an accessibility question, but I, it's one that I, I can't find it online right now. So with Windows 11, and I'm currently using uh, a Windows 10 Surface Book 2, um, and I keep getting the pop-up for Windows 11, but with the screen readers, are the screen readers like NVDA um, and JAWS able to handle Windows 11 right now? Well, that's a really good question. Uh, I believe they. I believe they are. The good news about uh, Windows 11 is uh, it's really just Windows 10 with a nice new paint job. So uh, it isn't hard for them to get. I mean, I, they have to adjust for the new user interface. For instance, the start menus in the middle and stuff like that. Um, I'm looking at Freedom Scientific site. They do Jaws, which is uh, you know I used to. Tell, tell people, oh, you know, you should go with something else like Orca because Jaws is so expensive. But they've really reduced the price on this considerably. And uh, do you use Jaws? What do you use, Kelvin? No, I use NVDA. NVDA, which is, free, which is a, that's open source. Uh, yeah. 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 And since I can write my own software and my own code, it makes it a lot easier for me. So Yeah. And obviously, you're a little bit more uh, skillful than a lot of people. Uh, that's pretty impressive. NVAccess.org for uh, NVDA. Um, let me see what they say about Windows 11. You're right to be you know, nervous. In fact, I think that's a good reason not to uh, accept Microsoft's blandishments and go and stay with 10 and say, yeah, fine. You know, you've got till 2025. 10 is not out of date. They're going to continue to update it. It's still really, in many ways, the current version of Windows. So there's no, no urgency. Uh, Jaws, Freedom Scientific says Jaws works fine with 11. I know, I'm looking on the uh, NV Access site, and I don't see any specific, but because it's open source, I'd be shocked if, it's, if it doesn't. I mean, that's something people would work on right away, wouldn't they? Yes and no. There, there's, there's hiccups in the NVDA, like, back end yeah. on certain issues. Like, if I'm using Excel, like, there's certain just nuances that that are not there, but they work. Um, and the other one that I also use in Narrator, which is the Windows. Yeah, that comes with, and that's and so, in 11, that's yeah. that's there still. I haven't heard of any changes in Narrator uh, between 10 and 11. This is what uh, NVDA says on their GitHub site, because they're open source. Although NVDA can run on any Windows version, starting from Windows 7 Service Pack 1, building NVDA from source is currently limited only to Windows 10 and above. So it sounds to me like they don't have a problem at all with Windows 11. Nice. All right. I'm getting ready to launch a new new product um, called the See Me Cane. So I, I was like, should I start learning how to use Windows 11 in this launching this product? Now that's a that's another challenge. You know, everybody who does software has to deal with this. You know, how important how important is it to support Windows 11? Microsoft. The last time I checked. Windows 11 adoption has been pretty strong. I mean, it's there's still more Windows 10 users. I think there's still more Windows XP users, to be honest with you. But uh, because Microsoft is being uh, pretty aggressive about it, uh, in at least in the first six months, it was very strong adoption. Uh, apparently, that has kind of slowed down this year. About 16% at the beginning of the year uh, of Windows users were using the latest uh, Windows 11. So it's, you know, it's not, I think it's gone up now to about 20%. So it's not completely dominant. Uh, Windows Windows 10 is 20, believe it or not, get this, Windows 10, uh, their 21H2 is 28%, the 21H1 is 26%. So together that's about half the uh, the, the world. Yep. But so 11 is still, uh, you know, a quarter, a fraction of the total usership. So there's not a lot of urgency yet, um, and especially yep. if you're uh, uh, appealing to blind users, which the CME Cane is, of course, for blind users. They're probably doing, having the same questions you are. Should we, should we change to 11? And I think the prudent thing, the smart thing for anybody using a specialized software is to not move until you're absolutely sure that, you know, it's worth doing. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I, mean, I, I wanted to put it out into the, to the 
into the radio and kind of see what do we get. Um, I know um, there's one guy that calls in uh, who's an expert. Julian Vargas. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Julian. Yeah. And so I'm good, but I, I don't keep up on the, all of the Calvin, back. you're more than good. <laughs> you're amazing. I am. I I mean, you're doing better than than people who have uh, sight and can hear and all that. You're doing great. Uh, DeafBlindPotter.com. He sells his pottery there. If you want to know more about the Sea Meat Cane, you can learn more about it there. So you're going to start making those, huh? Yeah, so we're getting ready to um, cross the border over to Mexico to start the manufacturing process. And then we just got a deal for testing in uh, uh, Louisville. I can't really give too much information on that, but... Um, yeah, we're getting ready to light up the world, light up the blind, and allow them to be light to the bl to provide them safety. So, uh, I'm the first ever to create a fully lit up lighted blind cane. The idea being that you know, of course, all pedestrians are at risk these days. It's terrifying yep. going out there. But imagine if you couldn't see, you're using a cane. Uh, the Simi cane lights up and uh, and uh, alerts drivers, at least if they're paying attention alerts drivers yep. that you're out there and to be careful. Yeah. Good. And it, it looks like a lightsaber, so you might as well be... It's pretty cool, too, right? Star Wars skills. Yeah, I think a lot of kids would go, I, I got to have one of them. Yeah. <laughs> I got to have one of them. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. So, the beauty of it, you can see it from 100 yards away, and we're basically giving power to the 253 million blind individuals in the world. And it it's estimated that 87, 87 million of us get hit by a car. So What? Um, yeah. 87 million? Yeah, so if you take the research that is one of every three visually impaired people, and so you take one of take one of those, and then out of the three, you would get the 87 million. One in three has been hit by a car? Yep. That's horrific. So. Oh, I'm so sorry. That is just awful. Just awful. Yeah. You know, we still are building, you know, I would love to bicycle to work, but it's just too dangerous. We're still building, you know, areas, residential areas with no sidewalks, no bike paths. The car has taken over the country. Cities, you know, are building huge swaths of, taking over huge swaths of area just for parking lots. We got to do something about this. This is crazy. Yep. I, I had no idea. One in three. I had no idea. That's terrible. Yep. Well, good luck on the see me cane. That's so important what you're doing. Deafblindpotter.com. You can buy his pottery there and you can see his streams. You can watch him work. It's pretty incredible. Calvin, always a pleasure hearing from you. All right. Thank you, Leo. Yeah. You guys have a good one. 8888 Ask Leo the phone number. Website techguylabs.com. We'll put a link to a Deafblind Potter there if you don't. You don't have to write it down. You can just go there at the end of the day. Techguylabs.com. More calls right after this. Nah, going on a cruise. Next week, I'll be here in the weekend after. I will not. Micah will be hosting on Saturday. I will be gone on uh, Saturday and Sunday. Uh, and then again, the following Saturday, and back on the Sunday in three weeks. Our Twit Cruise. Uh, yeah, Lawn Dog. I, yeah, if I, you know, it's really, I'm not sure what the internet situation is going to be like. Uh, what I will probably do... I mean, I, I'll check in in, uh, in the Discord uh, and the uh, IRC. Sometimes I do that if I can get online. What I'll probably do, uh, or almost certainly do, is record some stuff with me and Paul, like little videos or whatever. I think I'm going to bring the drones, so maybe we'll get some drone selfies and stuff, and we'll we'll post those. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 8888 Ask Leo. Hope you're having a great Fourth of July weekend. Glad we could be together. Alan on the line from Seal Beach, California. Hi, Alan. Hey, Leo. Welcome. I have a question about uh, Android phones or tablets. Okay. That have gone beyond their uh, life as far as the security patches. They need to be thrown away, or do they still have some use? Oh, that's a really good question. It's you know, it's kind of analogous to the question about people with older versions of Windows, older Macs, old you know, uh, Chromebooks. What do you do after the security patches stop? In theory, they are vulnerable, not instantly, but if somebody comes up with a hack and probably, you know, at some point that will happen, they won't get fixed. But the good news is, uh, in many cases, those older devices aren't really targets. Hackers would much prefer to 
hack something more recent where there's some real financial worth. Uh, Android's a little different because Android is always under attack, and Android, frankly, is not very secure. If you're, but when you buy a new phone, you should absolutely buy a phone where the man, and not all of them are like this, where the manufacturer is guaranteeing you at least three years of updates. So you know that phone's going to be good for three years. But then you have the really reasonable question, well, what do we do after the three years? It's, it's you know, <laughs> I, I guess here's how you could make it more safe. Um, you should get rid of any apps that aren't mainstream apps. You know, stick with apps from big companies like Google, Microsoft, and the like. Uh, you know, HBO would be fine. Uh, Netflix would be fine. Be very careful where you get your apps. Only get apps from the Google Play Store. That's no guarantee. We've seen malware in the Google Play Store, so you're going to want to keep your eye out. Uh, that's the number one way you get infected on Android. So if you have a set of apps that you use and you know they're good and they're fine, you're probably okay. You know, and updates will probably be okay. But again, it's risky because let's say the app was good, but it was made by uh, some oddball company who then sold to another company. This does happen, that happens to be malicious. And you get an update, suddenly that app, which was safe, is no longer safe. That's problem number one. Problem number two is clicks, clicking on websites, clicking on messages, clicking on Facebook or WhatsApp or Android messages with links. That can always be risky. Uh, we know on mobile devices that there are multiple attacks that can happen in a message with a link. So, you know, again, only, you know, be very careful about clicking links and messages. You just have to be more cautious, I guess. There is always the risk of something called a zero-click attack. This was a big problem with iPhones. But it was only a problem if you are a dissident, a journalist, somebody that a nation would want to attack. Because they're way too expensive to use just to make a few bucks in Bitcoin or whatever. So I think, honestly, in, in the real world... You're probably all right. Just you have to be much more cautious than you were. Okay. If you don't use the, if you stop using it or you never used it for banking or anything serious and you do get attacked, what so does what? It do? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, there are some, you know, you're right. I mean, what are they going to get? Well, there are a couple of things they can do. Sometimes they'll, they'll uh, put malware on there that watches all your keystrokes, hoping that you're going to enter a password to your bank or something. You've, you've eliminated that possibility because you're not using it for anything important. Uh, then they might put, it's not, this is a common attack these days, uh, a cryptocurrency miner on your phone. That's not going to hurt you. It's just going to slow your phone down. Uh, and it's probably not, you know, even going to work very well. So, and these days, because cryptocurrencies values dropped so much, <laughs> that may be less of a problem than it was. Uh, in order to make money doing that, you'd have to put it on hundreds of thousands of phones. You're only going to make a penny once in a while. Uh, what else could they do? So, uh, that's pretty much it. I mean, your, your biggest threat is privacy invasion, security for uh, bank accounts, things like that, and crypto miners. Other than that, I think you're fine. You know, now that I think about it, go ahead. <laughs> Keep using it. Listen to music. That's fine. Um, I'd be a little careful about surfing the net because it is possible to, let's say, here's the scenario you want to watch out for. Uh, your Android phone is now out of regular updates. Somebody finds a way to hack an Android phone through a website. Not at all uncommon. You go to that website. The website sees your phone, attempts the attack, the attack succeeds. Now the guy's got something on your phone. Could be a Trojan horse that's watching your keystrokes. Could turn on the camera, the microphone. You'd know that, though. There'd be a light that would come on, that kind of thing. Uh, it's You know, I think for most of us, you know, those of us who are not working for three-letter agencies in Virginia, it's probably not a real problem. Okay. All right. Well, get a phone. Get a new phone when you can. Okay. Yes, that would be my advice. And if you're doing that, then get it from a company like Samsung. Google's probably the best. Uh, LG just announced it's interesting they stopped making LG Android phones but they did say which and kudos to them they're going to support those for three more years that's great very few Android phones have updates for more than three years it's not the update to the next version of Android you care about by the way I don't care about Android 13, 14, 15 whatever that doesn't matter it's the monthly security patches you want to get 
And those are the ones that are going to stop when your phone goes uh, out of date. If you have an Android phone now, right now, you can look at the about in the about phone. What is your current security patch status? Let me look. I have a Samsung uh, Galaxy S22 here. Oh, I have a software update, so that's good. I'm going to run that. But I bet you I don't have my probably my latest update at this point is is May, and here we are in July. You, by the time you get about ten days into a month, Google has pushed out an update. The real test of these companies is how long after Google puts out the update will it take for them to get that update on your phone? Uh, let me see. This oh goodness, yep. The Google Play System update May first on this S twenty two. But as I said, I have an update which will probably get me into June at least. I'm going to guess it's going to be June. Eighty eight eighty eight. Ask Leo. Good question. You know, a lot of times we talk about security. And it's very black and white. Like, oh, you're not secure. But what does that really mean? Does it mean you shouldn't use that device? I think you probably, in most cases, continue to use it with caution. Jimmy's on the line from Whittier, California. Hi, Jimmy. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hey, Leo. Uh, I got a question for you. I've got a, I have picked up a Samsung 75-incher from Costco over Memorial Day. Nice. On it. Very nice. But I'm afraid I'm gonna, I'm afraid I'm going to lose my, my geek card here. I tried to get the remote to work on my smartphone with the app, and, oh, my gosh, I can't get it to work, right? Every time I try to connect it, it connects it, but it asks my TV, do you allow this to work? <laughs> What's the point of having the remote on my smartphone if I lose the remote if I can't tell the TV to allow the smartphone to work? Oh, so you've, you've already lost the remote on the new TV. Well, I, I got five kids, so of course <laughs> the remote's under the couch somewhere, uh, and so you're trying, and rightly so, you're trying to use it. So the TV, normally, what would happen in a lot of cases, a lot of TVs, what would happen is you would get on the remote on your phone. Okay, right. the number is six one two five, and yeah. you'd say six one two five on your screen on your TV, and you'd say, yeah, that's match, or this TV screen would show a number, and then you enter it on the phone. But it's not doing that; it's something else. It wants you to do it with a remote. Yeah, it doesn't seem to be storing, like, I don't know, the IP address of my phone. Like, it's on the same Wi-Fi network, all, all of that stuff. But every time I, it, quote, connects my phone to the TV, it asks, do you allow? I've even gone in. And there's no point at that point where the TV says allow. Well, the TV asks allow, but it doesn't, like save a profile or something. Oh, you ha does it every single time is what you're saying. Correct. Bingo. Ah, so you can use it. You just have to allow yeah. each and every time. Yeah, but but then that means if I lost my remote, I can't turn the <laughs> oh, oh, you still have your remote. You're just worried about future. Reasonably yeah. so with yeah, five kids. I mean, I've, I've, it's now happened twice where I'm <laughs> the TV remote. So, okay, I'll I'll, I don't, I'm running out of time. You hear the sound. I'm going to take a break, but let me look and see if I can find out what the answer is from Samsung. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's, it's not, it's like, that's like, it's not saving the cookie that says, yeah, allow yeah. it. Make allow it. It shouldn't have to keep asking. It does seem weird that it doesn't. Well, and I and I went on the Apple iOS store to, I mean, to, and there's seems like two, three, four dozen different smartphone universal remote apps. And oh well, use the Samsung one, the Smart Things app. Oh, yeah, that could be one issue if you're not using the official Samsung. Well, the Smart Things app sounds more like a home automation thing. There's not, I couldn't even find the official Samsung. TV remote. No, yeah, that Samsung wants you to use everything. Everything Samsung is a smart thing. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to add your TV to smart things as a device. Then you can open the smart things app on your phone. And under the devices, you'll see your TV. This will, by the way, this will fix this whole thing. Then you will get a remote on the screen in the smart things app that is your TV remote. I don't have, yeah. you know, I don't it's have a, smart. No, it's a, yeah, you know, this is Samsung. Uh, so they bought a company smart. called Smart Things, and they've gotcha. decided to label everything Smart Things. But the, but the trick is, 
The manual doesn't say anything about that. <laughs> pages <laughs> hey, at least you got a manual. So the trick is well, you you gotta you gotta add your TV to the app as a device. Kind of like your Amazon, you know, when you get the Alexa app yeah, and you yeah, say yeah. add the Alexa. Uh, so I think you go into the app, uh, you tap the devices button, and then uh, you can add the device. That some, some TVs will use Bluetooth. Sometimes they'll use ultrasonic sound that you can't hear. But, it, but what you'll want to do is scan to see if it's, and stand next to the TV and scan it. And at some point, the TV will show up. And you go, yes, that's you. That's you. Let me see. You're on an iPhone, you said? Yeah. IPhone. Okay. In fact, I'm going to put a link to the Samsung instructions for adding the TV oh, perfect. into the show notes. And uh, once you've added the TV, then you go into the Smart Things app and you should be able to, you actually, they give you a kind of a nice little uh, screen interface for remote access. Oh, that would be cool. Yep. The other thing on the TV that's a huge frustration is it does have like a quasi internet browser on there, right? If you're oh, gonna go I know. stream something. It's it's terrible. It's terrible. First problem it's terrible. Try to make it nice no. by making it easy to add a space, uh, a re a go, like a return, enter, or a delete. But it forces you to have to move away from that every time you enter a keystroke. Oh god. Does that make sense? It, yes. It's, it's the worst. I'm sure someone thought it was more convenient, but it's yeah. the worst thing if you're trying no. to actually enter a URL. I'll be honest with you. I have a Samsung TV. I never use the apps on it, ever. Okay. Um, I wish I could buy a TV that wasn't smart and and just use a Roku or an Apple TV or something to do that. You know, we, we considered that, and we have... You know, all the kids and all the different apps. and It's so much easier, I know. Exactly. Yeah. They, mine's on Hulu. Mine's on Apple I know. TV. Mine's on... Well, if you get... But if you get a Roku or an Apple TV, uh, then you have Hulu, then you have Amazon Prime, then you have all of the channels on it. And so they just use that. Just use that. Uh, it's a little more complicated now, though, because you have to turn that on. Yeah. But the Samsung apps are notorious, especially the browser. Samsung made a T, it made a refrigerator with a browser in it, and then, and then they didn't update the browser. So these poor people who have this t refrigerator, which is perfectly good, it's only a few years old, but they have a big screen on it. They can't do anything with. Can't do anything. Oh, that's funny. So silly. That's funny. So silly. Um. I don't know if you have a split second for another question. I do. The I got the Samsung uh, from Costco, the sound bar. Nice. Um, I forget what model, but it, yeah. you know, it kind of pairs with it. It runs over eARC. I kind of like it. Yeah. Um, but I got the hanging mount bars to hang it underneath <laughs> the TV on the nice articulating mount off the wall. Nice. Um, it kind of, the sound feels, it just doesn't have that sharp definition is, is there some way to fix that i tried the dts and all the different so it sounds a little like muddy yes well I'm not sure how much did you pay for the sound bar uh, i want to say i paid 100 180 or something like it was costco's should sound better than that but maybe yeah it shouldn't sound muddy uh a cheap soundbar, mostly you just won't have the bass that you want and that kind of thing. It should it's, be. It's got the soundbar and the the subwoofer down on the floor. Oh, it's the two piece. Oh, huh? Two I don't know. Maybe it's just not functional. The good thing about a okay. about a uh, those uh, stores is you can usually say, "Hey, this sounds like crap. Give me another one." Okay. Okay. I'll try. Uh, it shouldn't sound muddy. It, you, it might not sound. It might sound tinny, <laughs> but it shouldn't sound muddy. <laughs> um, you're that's using the like eARC. That's idea. good. Um, it could be that you, you want to check the settings on the TV to make sure you're sending the best uh, output, not PCM, but Dolby audio or whatever. Yeah. You, hmm. I mean, I'm letting the TV manage all of it. And I'm, you know, I just, yeah, but look in the audio menu on the TV and place play with it a little bit. You might be able to find a better okay. setting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because, uh, I mean, you're sending it out the eARC. That's the best way to do it. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, it's, and it is a Samsung. Yeah, and it's a Samsung device. So it should yep. 
should work perfectly. But there may well be settings that you can to improve it, get it improved. Okay. Is it just the dialogue that sounds muddy, or is it all everything? Music sounds bad. You know, I, I feel like it's it's, and I you know I'm no expert on this, but you know depending on what channels of audio whoever made the the source or the, the well that may clip, be yeah you know may have mixed things weird yeah that may be the surround you know it's almost like someone tried to cheat it with phasing rather than two oh multi yeah you know what make sure you uh, make sure try different encodings uh on the tv okay. i bet you that's what'll that'll help it okay you don't want just stereo out you want dolby yeah i, I mean i put it to the dolby dts Play, uh, play with it then. It. Try something else. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It shouldn't sound bad. It could just be a bad source I was playing with. Could be, yeah. Awesome. Hey, a pleasure talking to you, Jimmy. Thank you very what much. What are you doing for the 4th of July with the kids? You going to the fireworks? Oh, you know what? My neighborhood does this really cool thing. They do a little bit of a block party and our local fire department, a uh, little fire station, they come out and around 10 o'clock. The kids, they all decorate their bicycles and scooters. Oh, how fun. And we just do this little tour around the neighborhood oh how fun um you know and then you know some kid gets a prize for having the best decorated scooter and the best decorated dog and the best decorated stroller and you know that kind of thing it's, that sounds great really fun. sounds it's, really fun yeah yeah and we uh, we will put an article on um setting up eARC with the samsung tv thank you joe he just put it oh, in the uh, chat room will, we'll put that up in the show notes i will look i will look for that thank you very have much. a great time jimmy okay appreciate it bye well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smartwatches, <laughs> television sets, everything. Anything with a chip in it. 8888-ASK-LEO, the phone number. 8888-ASK-LEO. Give me a ring. Let's talk high tech. You and me. Uh, I did run the uh, Samsung Galaxy S22 Ultra update through the break. And lo and behold, Android security patch level, June. That's pretty good. That's good. No, you know what? That's really good. I would have been nice to see July, but I don't think I probably here we are only on the third day of July. They, I, I, Google probably hasn't put that out yet. So June, June is good. That's as good as it can get. So that's but that's the advantage of getting the latest phone, right? I uh, I think probably. The sweet spot for new phones is probably every three years. You want to keep it long enough so that, you know, you get the value of the purchase. But these things get beat up. They get banged up. They, they need updates. Uh, I think it's probably, and I think they're designed. It's interesting because in the U.S., at least when they subsidized phones the phone companies would subsidize them for two years you remember that you you'd buy it they stopped doing it but you'd buy a phone for 50 bucks but you'd have to sign up for a two-year contract so that kind of predisposed people to think oh i'm getting a new phone every two years because it'll be paid off by then in other countries it's longer i think canada's three years i think there are some countries in the eu where there are four years so you know if you're still paying for the phone after year four <laughs> You're not going to buy a new phone. That's crazy. You want to pay it off before you buy a new one. So I think that that sort of conditions you to uh, how long you're going to own it. Canada's two years. Okay, well, we're not, somebody told me it was three. Maybe not in Canada. Maybe in another country. Three or four years. And it doesn't matter anymore because phone companies no longer, you know, for the most part, do that. They don't subsidize the phones anymore. Uh, you could spread the, it's not a subsidy. It's, uh, you could spread payments out. You could pay on time over time, but that's not the same thing. 8888-ASK-LEO. Julian on the line. Oh, Julian. Hello, Julian. Hello, hello, Leo. Your, your ears were burning. We were talking about you last hour. Julian Vargas. Yeah, I, I, I heard and I fought the busies and I made it through. So <laughs> he fought hey. through the busy signals. <laughs> uh, techjv.com. Julian is a blind user who helps other blind users get the most out of their technology, and we are very grateful for all you do. Now, you heard Kelvin's question, and I think you yeah. found it, have an answer. My, my answer generally is, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Uh, 
if you're running Windows 10, which is still very much being supported, and you rely on that computer for important things, as he seems to, I don't see the hurry in going to Windows 11. I mean, you know, unless there's something specific about that that would enhance what he's doing. But I think in general, especially when you're relying on access software that's not provided by Microsoft, you got to give those developers time to bang on that version of Windows a little bit and work out the kinks a little bit. Unless, you know, if you got a spare computer laying around or you like to tinker, you know, some of us do. <laughs> I'm running iOS 16 and uh, having some fun with yeah, that. Yeah, well, now that's not even out yet. You're using the developer beta, I think. Yeah, yeah. so, you know, you're, uh, you know, you, you, you just, it depends on your willingness to tinker. And by the way, thank you, Apple, for listening to what a lot of blind people wanted and giving us the eloquence voice. <laughs> oh, what's the eloquence voice? It's a voice that has been used for years on Access software such as JAWS and others, and uh, we've been wanting that for years. It's, it's a very robotic-sounding voice, so the average person isn't going to care for it. But it's nice because you can speed it up, and it's still very understandable. Ah. It's, it's just great. So I, I thank Apple for that. I wanted to do that on the air. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say to the uh, uh, deafblind Potter there is I'm intrigued by that cane that he's talking about. Oh, yeah, the see-me cane. I'd like, to yeah. talk, I'd like to talk to him about that a little bit because I have some thoughts about canes. And Good. In general, I'm, I've tried all kinds of them, and in general, I'm not a big fan of putting technology. You know, you say things with a chip in it. Sometimes I don't think that a cane needs a chip in it. But uh, the idea of lighting the cane is intriguing, but it's just it's got to be made to withstand uh, wear and tear. Sure. Uh, the, the cane that I use is pretty beat up, and sometimes people ask me, you know, don't you bump into things all the time, or how do you stay safe? And I say, look at this cane. See how this looks? It bumps those into things all for me. <laughs> yeah, those are all bumps that I did not have to take. I love it. You know, a, I love it. has to be able to withstand the, the wear and tear. Yeah, they have all kinds of high-tech canes. I know they vibrate and buzz and, and make sounds yeah, and, and so I've forth. Yeah, i tried them all, and they're yeah. fun toys, but in general, at the end of the day, I, I don't know, I just think that the long white cane, uh, they also try to get fancy with the designs now and putting all these colors in them. And I think that you got to stick with what's uh, universally recognized, the long white cane. If you're a tall person and you walk fast, the, tall, the longer the better because it gives you time to react to something that you come across. And it does also make you a lot visible, especially uh, when crossing streets. Uh, that, you know, in, in an interesting way, the two things you said are linked. There are two kinds of people in the world. There are people who, early adopters like me, who just want to, and you, I guess, who always want to use the latest and greatest and see. And, and in order to do that, uh, you know, we put ourselves on the line. We get canes that are too high tech and break easily, or we get operating systems that aren't ready for prime time. But that's kind of the deal, right? Well, but I want to try the latest. And then the wise, smart people... <laughs> <laughs> learn i think probably that simplicity is better there's no rush stick with the tried and true and sometimes you know getting too fancy can make for problems so that's i think they're related now how do, i'm looking uh on my iphone where is the eloquence voice is it only in ios 16 now it's 16 it's a, it's under voiceover and under speech and i'm i see i have samantha in my voiceover right now that's right, the that's, default that's the standard that's yeah. always been the standard and until now it was the best in terms of the things i look for but i never really liked her sound and it's i'm happy to say that samantha's out of my life finally <laughs> she's out of my life she's i'm gonna download the enhanced Samantha. but that's a good point is that you have a different need so you're not looking for it to sound human at all no, you're looking for no. it to work well with screen readers to adjust to speeds without being less intelligible things like that Right. The, the human voices are great if you're going to run them slower. And what's nice is you can, you can customize things to, for example, if you're reading an ebook, you can have the other voice that sounds nicer and more human-like for that purpose. Right. But for everyday browsing, you know, when you're having to move through a lot of emails, as I do, and, and, and read a lot of stuff on the web like I do, you, you don't want to, you know, you want to get, you want to maximize. So just like sighted people skim real fast and yeah. speed read, that makes we sense. do the same with our ears. And, uh, and a voice like Eloquence really makes that a lot easier. Hey, good good to know. And this is why you tried iOS 16, because you've got to advise people. So I will take a look at that when I, I get iOS 16, because I'm not in a rush. 
Nice to talk to you. Giving them a lot of feedback, which is the other important thing. Very important for blind people to do. Absolutely. So far, so far, they've fixed a few things I've reported. So that's the good thing. TechJV.com. His phone number's there. His email's there. And Kelvin, if you're listening, you might want to contact him. Or of course, uh, Julian, you can also go to Kelvin's site, DeafBlindPotter.com, and I think he has an email. I'll do that. Address there. Good to talk to you as always. I appreciate all you do for uh, all of us. Rod Pyle, WSPACE FM. I don't hear Rod. I don't hear Rod. Rod is speaking. Rod is speaking. Sorry, that was me. I had it on mute. Oh, bad me. Bad Rod. Bad, bad. Rod, are you getting your hair cut or are you grad going to a graduation? Oh wait, a minute. I, I see the uh, logo on the on the shirt now, so I know. This. Oh yeah, I just thought you were wearing a a, a, a gown of some kind. A bib, yeah, a bib. No, nothing that fancy. <laughs> That's only when I eat. So, you sound uh, so good on that Sure SM. Uh, is that an SM seven B? Is that what? Yeah, that is? sounds yeah. so good. Oh, good, good. Yeah, yeah. I, that, I agonized over it. And, did you? When'd you get it? Oh gosh. Just before we started. So oh, okay. A year and a half ago or something. Oh, okay. Yeah, you sound great. Yeah, I got that. I got a little focus right and a cloud lifter and everything Ooh. but a cough button. You know what you need? Huh? You need the big bottom. <laughs> Is that a thing? That's a thing. Is that I a think device? it's from DBX. Yeah, you push a button and all of a sudden you sound like this. <laughs> Daddy's got a big bottom. That. Yeah. All the DJs, all the DJs use it. I'm on my yeah. big bottom. I don't have it. Yeah, I'm bottom. no DJ, mister. Yeah, mister. <laughs> I, I am great. I went company. to see my mom. It was so much fun. Go back yeah. east. Oh, oh so beautiful. Great. Wore nice my mask travel, at huh? every uh, place, and I felt safe, and I didn't get it. You know, I tested every day before I went to see mom, so oh. I am fine, and uh, <laughs> it's reassuring. I have, a dear friend, I have a dear friend that just went back to Pittsburgh for his daughter's wedding. Masked up, you know what's coming here. You know, he, he was wearing it in 95 on the plane, didn't take it off the whole thing, got there, infected about five people. They had to call the wedding off. Oh, no. Yeah. He got he them sick? He quarantine to come back, yeah. How does he know it was him and not some other guy? Well, he works for the county. Uh, he's been working the county's health bill for the last three years, oh. so he's pretty well tuned into things, and he said, I did tracing and it was me oh my god, oh so my god. is that a nightmare oh. see that's not a good thing to know because normally you have plausible deniability you can say right well, right it wasn't me i got it from the groom or no, whatever I, i'm an expert i get to decide it's me <sighs> that's kind of heartbreaking so he didn't get it on the plane did he bring it was he did he have it already he doesn't know he doesn't um know. he thinks he might have gotten it on the plane because mm. not many people were masked except him but well, I, I think if you have, a, I was that. hoping, see, I was taking the moral of this lesson because I was, you know, one of a handful of masked people yeah. and my daughter, the moral of my lesson was we wear a good N95 mask all the time. It doesn't matter if other people aren't masking, but maybe that's not the case. Because I, well, you know, don't, I don't want to get, I'm, we're doing a cruise in two weeks. Yeah. And don't eat and drink. Oh God, is it two weeks? I guess it is. Yeah. It's two weeks. Wow. Okay. I'll come back to you, my friend. All right. Stay there. A little John Philip Souza on this 4th of July weekend. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 8888, ask Leo. We used to, when I was a kid, uh, every summer, we would drive up to Cooperstown, New York. And, uh, I mean, really old school, beautiful, well, it was also a long time ago. Beautiful town. They have a, a, a beautiful park in the center of town. Yes, the Baseball Hall of Fame is there. Beautiful park in the center of town with a big gazebo. Well, it, was, it wasn't It was just a gig. It was a band stage, and they'd have the band come, and they'd play John Philip Sousa marching music, wave the flags, set up. They had great fireworks over the lake, Lake Otsego. It was such a good time. That's my memory of, of a kind of a classic old-school 4th of July. Now we have drones and laser shows. What can I say? And probably the band shell is gone, too. 8888, ask Leo. Uh... It's not the best music, John Philip Sousa music. I understand the young people probably go, eh, do you have any Lana Del Rey? I, maybe some Billie Eilish? I don't know. Something cool, something hip. But uh, it, it certainly feels, you know, when you play that, it feels patriotic. Laura, you're a young person. When you hear that... I love I was in band. You love it. Oh, you were in band. Oh, you're a band <laughs> yeah. nerd. Now I understand. What did you play in the band? 
saxophone. Alto. Saxophone? You can't march with a saxophone. I wasn't in marching band. Oh, you were in a sit-down band. I get it. Okay. I do like it. Da, 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 da. All right, let's uh, <laughs> let's go on with the show. G. Scott, my good friend, an audiophile from Finland, Michigan. Hello, G. Scott. Yeah. Hey, Lee, how are you doing? I'm great. You're uh, you're in um, you're in uh, Minnesota for the summer. I bet it's beautiful. Yeah, here working. Yeah, beautiful and. Uh, it's pretty wet, so the mosquitoes sure busted loose. But uh, yeah, we're doing okay. Yeah, how big are those? Are those mosquitoes the size of uh, robins? They big. Well, they get there. Jeez. Yeah, but they make what they lack in size. They make up in quantity. <laughs> <laughs> oh, who invented the mosquito, and uh, and why is the question? Hey, yeah, yeah, that's the question of the age of yeah. the months. Yeah. What can I do for you, G. Scott? Well, uh, a couple things. First, couple comments. I'm mm -hmm. going to defend Micah. Yesterday, you said he was too nice. <laughs> I'm going back. You don't think he's too nice? That's <laughs> you were. You were equally nice to me. You and you and Patrick Norton back screensavers days gave me a. Uh, we were, it was some registry hack, and I can't even remember what it oh, was. Wow! But I couldn't do anything. And so I emailed you, and you did email me back the fix. So. Oh yeah, so I was uh, I was uh, mocking, not not seriously, yeah, but yeah. I was mocking Micah because he, from time to time on this show, when he's on the show on Saturdays, will say, "All right, give me your email address, and uh, I'll send. I'll we'll will help you on offline." Yeah. And uh, and apparently, I've done that in the past once. With you, at least once. <laughs> With you, yeah. But uh, yeah. that way can lead to uh, to disaster. I oh, part okay. of the reason I don't do that is I just don't want people to think that I uh, I'm the help desk twenty four seven. Exactly. Yeah. No, I'm the same in my business. I'm kind of. Equally, you know, I do septic system design and install. And people have a problem with their septic system. It's, it's Actually, I'm glad you're on because I have a question. No, I won't do that to you. <laughs> I but I completely understand. You go to a party and you are the center of attention. So uh, let me ask you a question. We, yeah, 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 yeah. I know that feeling. So, so my my question of the day, though. Um, so I've I, I had the Surface Studio One, still have. And because I do Minnesota, California, that thing was traveling back and forth. Wait a minute, the desktop it. one? Yes. That's a big old thing to carry around. Okay. All right. Well, I kept the box and it had that nice handle on it yeah. and it was kind of like a big I loved my box. Surface Studio. It was it was underpowered, but boy, what a nice device that was. Yeah, I did the Padre upgrade and so I Oh, you did. Oh, good. And, and yeah. So I, it's, I still love the thing. Uh the display is great. Um but I gave mine to Aunt Pruitt, and he wouldn't. Yeah. He would. <laughs> it was later, he posted somewhere. Yeah, I was stuck with that Surface Studio for six months. Oh man, <laughs> he hated it. Oh. He hated it. Oh. I thought I was doing something nice for him. I love mine, and I'm Good. Surface all the way. You know, Surface Book, Surface Book Two, Surface Pro. Now I got the Surface Laptop Studio, which is a nice, real nice laptop because yep. it folds down and all. Yep. I'm waiting for the Surface Studio Three. Yeah, don't you don't hold your breath. I don't think they're going to do it. So, so and that's my question. Um, I, I I like that big monitor. I actually bought a big monitor. And Thirty-two I, inches, I and it's on an arm, which means you can tilt it down to as little as five degrees, like a drafting table, or up. It's a very nice all-in-one. But for some reason, Microsoft, I think to keep the cost down, they spent so much on the monitor that they didn't put a lot of horsepower in the computer it's like a slow laptop and right. it's disappointing because you've got this great monitor but you can't you know really use the design software you'd like to and it's a photographer and i think it just was a pig with photoshop and lightroom and he that's probably why and, he didn't like and it. for me see i'm not doing what ant's doing I, you know yeah. I'm, I'm making 2d drawings for my project uh, layouts and whatnot perfect for that what's um, what tool do you I'm use what software about... do you use um, uh, well, right now, I just tried this new one, uh, Review. It's from Blue Dream, I think, or something like is that. Is this for, uh, specifically for uh, for septic systems, or is it uh, just a design tool? Well, uh, uh, Excel I use for the for the numbers. Uh -huh. And then for the drawings, um, you know, I, I've been using actually Home Plan Pro for nice. some years. Yeah, there's and, no uh, need to do more. Yeah. 
You know, lay it out? But, yeah. So I'm wondering about the monitor. Can I get an equal, equally nice monitor and maybe just a desktop? You know, I haven't had a desktop computer since my yeah, last react I, to the old gateway Windows 98. We ask, uh, uh, Paul and Mary Jo ask Microsoft regularly, where is the next Surface Studio? They did two versions and they stopped, and I don't think they're going to do another one. I think that's no. pretty much the consensus. Can you get a monitor that good? I wished Microsoft would have just sold that monitor and let us attach a computer to it. They never did yeah. that. There are reasons, probably. Apple does the same thing with its beautiful 5K iMac. Uh, because in order to drive those monitors with such high resolutions, you need special hardware more than just a monitor. Plus, it had some nice features. Remember, you, you probably got that dial that you could put on the monitor, and yep. it, yeah, and it's so, and it was a great touch device. Um, it those displays, I think, were the per Pixel Perfect displays. Microsoft bought a company called Pixel Perfect, and I I'm wondering if uh, there are going to be I would imagine that there are third-party displays, touch displays that are as good, but I don't know. I'm Windows, and I like touch. So yeah, you want well. That's the whole point of that display. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't. I don't think Microsoft's selling them. <laughs> uh, maybe we, maybe somebody listening will have a recommendation. I mean, I. The problem is touch. You want a high resolution, high quality monitor with excellent color reproduction that also does very high resolution touch. The knob you can live with that, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, that was kind of a, a little gimmicky, but you know, I've yeah. used it every now and then, but yeah. mostly it's pen, mostly yeah. it's uh, you know, it's that touch ability. Normally I recommend Dell. I, I have a Samsung in front of me. I mean, all the monitors are pretty good these days, the uh, ultra fine from LG, but touch is the trick. Let me do some research, G. Scott, mm -hmm. and okay. I will get back to you. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. As Gumby says, most Windows users are starved for touch. <laughs> Let me think. That's a really good question. You know, that especially now, do you also need it to be able to tilt to five degrees? Uh, you know, I do like that uh, yeah. capability. You know, a lot of times I'm using the pen, and then that really comes in handy to be able to be on top of it. And yeah. In front of it. That's, that was the thing that I thought was really uh, great about that studio. So Dell does make now a uh, touch. They have, I'm looking at a Dell 24 touch monitor that tilts back to five degrees. So it does have that tilt stand, which is really, really cool. Let, yeah. me, see, let me see if they make a, a bigger one. Because um, that is that is part of the, the feature of it. And Dell's higher-end monitors, I think, are, are quite good. But this isn't, you know, yours is, ours is what, 32 inches? It's big. I think 29. It's 29? Nice. Okay. It's nice, yeah, because it's that 2 by 3 but it's a nice big monitor. And so let's I see if we can get it. I can uh, open three windows and, and uh, you know, so that's handy. You know, yeah. It's really, you know... Part of, part of the reason I'm holding out for the 3, if it ever came, was they said that the 2 would not support Windows 11. Ugh. Can and you, so I, oh, Microsoft you drives me crazy. Microsoft. <laughs> yeah, oh, they drive me crazy. Um, the only one I see that tilts back is this, It's and it's only 24 inches, which really is too small, I think. But it's called the Dell Touchscreen. Okay. Uh, let me see uh, if there's any. Let's see if ViewSonic has something. Touch screen. I always buy Dell. I like Dell monitors. I'm uh, I'm I'm a fond of those. ViewSonic does make more touch monitors, but they don't make them that big. There must mm. be something. Let's see. Optical touch. No, we want we want capacitive touch. Well, that's interesting. So they. Uh, ViewSonic makes them for a variety of uh, uses because they have a variety of different kinds of touch. Um, yeah, they don't they don't go so big. The biggest is uh, looks like uh, twenty four inches. Must be something about that. You know, I think that's that explains a lot about the studio. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the that that monitor was so big and so expensive. That's why they scrimped on the body, and it's why they're not making it anymore. Yeah, and and like I say for me, I mean I'm not, you know, video editing. I'm not, you know, I'm I'm not, you know, a super power user or anything where I needed 
you know, just upgrading those SSDs for me. That was huge. No, I was so glad that Padre did that for us. Uh, yeah, yeah. He loved, that was a good project. He loved that project. Um, yeah, no, I looked through it a few times to get yeah. dialed in, but boy, I yeah. was, uh, definitely, yeah. I miss having Padre around. I got to tell you, he was oh, great. Yeah. Uh, I don't, you know, it looks like everything we can find, they're small. 24 is the biggest. Yeah. Um, let's see if I can find a 31-inch touch screen monitor. Let's see what we can find here. Uh, it looks like Asus may make one. So I'm on Newegg now, and uh, Newegg will let me narrow it down to... Yeah, no. Forget it. Still. Forget it. Yeah. I think that's what was unusual about this. It was a big touchscreen, high quality. It was very high quality monitor. Yeah. Um, and for a long time, I, I asked Paul, I said, when is, when is Microsoft going to sell this uh, standalone? This monitor is great. And they never did. They bought a company to do this. Is it Pixel Perfect? I can't remember. Um, I might have said the wrong name. Anyway, I got to run because I got to. I have a little guy called Rocket Man. Yeah, yeah I, I hear him in the back. <laughs> hey, uh, Fluence is really good. I got it both Minnesota, California homes, and it is a good speaker. Oh, good to know. That was Scott right. recommending that yesterday. Yeah, good to know. Very good. Yep. Thank you, G. Thank Scott. You. Take care. Bye. Rocket Man Rod Pyle is here. He's the editor in chief of Ad Astra Magazine, the international. National Space Organization <laughs> Society <laughs> NSS Thank you .org. There we go. Thank you uh, The National Space Society uh, He's also the author of so many great books my, I'm going to plug my favorite though Because I'm a big fan of Neil Armstrong And Apollo and Eleven and, There you it know, is I was just you know, I was visiting my uh, old family home In Providence um, A friend of mine lives there now Which is fascinating just coincidental. And I was uh, standing out front. Alex came out. I said, Alex, take me inside. Let's see. And I pointed. I said, see that alcove right there? In 1969, that's where I watched Neil Armstrong step on the moon. And I will never forget that. Of course, you can kind of relive it with his book, First on the Moon, the Apollo 11 50th Anniversary Experience. Really beautiful pictures and images. What a story, too. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Rob. We were, we were so fortunate to be alive to see that. I agree. Those were magic times. Yeah. Maybe they're coming back, though. That's why we have Rod well, do a show called This Week in Space, because space is back, baby. <laughs> and speaking of This Week in Space. Yes. We had a really great episode Friday. Um, had our Jeff, uh, Jeff Nakam was our, our guest host, because... Tariq's in Singapore for a few weeks. From space.com, yeah. From space.com. We were able to get Mark Clampen, who's the former project scientist for the web. Now he's the chief of the science and exploration director at NASA headquarters, which means he's overseeing everything. But he's still, of course, very focused on web. And as you probably know, the first science images are going to be coming out from NASA on July 12th. The web so, is not only is operational, but one scientist was brought to tears yeah. by the images. I mean, this is so exciting. Well, I think a lot so more exciting. people will be. It's, it's a big, big deal. And the fact that it worked, I mean, I'm still stuck on the fact that everything deployed Unbelievable. properly. But we asked him, you know, they're not talking about exactly what's going to come come down on those first those first images. But we said, can you just give us kind of a preview of what you expect for the first year? Because there's going to be a lot of incredible stuff. And he said, well, we'll have at least one, quote, time travel image, unquote, <gasps> I'm paraphrasing here. But basically looking, I mean, because one of the big things about web is it's in, it operates in infrared, so it can see past the dust. So the things, the beautiful images the Hubble has given us over the years, a lot of those are big dust clouds. And they're very pretty, but it obscures what's beyond them. And the only way we've been able to see past some of those is with what's gra called gravitational lensing, where galaxies will bend light around them and magnify something further away. But the Hubble is going to punch through all that and see the back web. to... The web. Uh, sorry, the web. Thank you. See back to the formation of the first galaxy. We, so we think is, that that is one of the images they're going to show us. Yeah. Uh, will be and, uh, the farthest space photograph ever taken. Right. 
And we're talking about one to 200 million years after the Big Bang. Which You in, call it time big... travel because it takes so long the light to get here that the light we're seeing is, a, is hundreds of billions of years old. Right? How old is it? Oh, my God. Rod just froze solid. He's so excited. 13 billion. Okay, so it's not as old as I thought. But still, that's pretty amazing. And to, to get to see uh, starlight from 120 million years after the Big Bang, which, of course, is when we think the universe began, we've lost Rod. Uh, I see him on the hotline. Let me pick him up on the on the phone. Yeah. Sorry, I guess we, we lost you, but we'll keep that frozen picture of you up on... <laughs> Up on the screen, for those of you watching video. So, uh, the, John, who is our expert, says the universe is estimated to be 13 billion years old. So they they would be seeing 13. back 7. to 13.7. So they'd be yeah. seeing back to a, to within 120 million years of the Big Bang. That's that's pretty close to the beginning. That's like a couple of seconds after after the big flash, you know. And uh, that do they is it accepted widely that there was a big bang? I know that that was a theory for a long time. Yeah, yeah, it, it's pretty much a, a done deal. I mean, there was talk about the sort of steady state theory that I think it was Fred Hoyle. Was Fred Hoyle said the universe does not expand and contract. I do not believe it. He was proven wrong. Right. Right. So it, it's we're pretty certain. So we're seeing things back in the earliest days. And that gives them ideas of how planets formed and so forth. There's Is there a chance we will learn something that will blow our minds? Oh, there I see you. You've unfrozen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll go back. OK, yeah, I'll turn off the phone. So uh, is there a chance that we will see something that will just blow our minds that we will go? <gasps> Well, I don't think we're going to see anybody flashing a more. No, 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 no. Kind of <laughs> no, I don't think aliens. In terms of <laughs> of very cool stuff, yeah, because everything from Hubble was was in the visual wavelength, and there's just a lot of limits. Plus, Hubble orbited the Earth in, in low orbit, so it would go in and out of sunlight every 45 minutes. And of course, when you're on the sunlit side, you can't observe, right? And the the telescope was constantly heating up and cooling so off. Webb so Webb is at the is, Lagrange point. It's a million kilometers out, right? Right, right. more than that. Yeah, so the fact I'm sorry, the Lagrange far, point. And it's it's got shielding on it, so it can work 24-7. Wow. So, yeah, I think we're going to be just gobsmacked. And let's not forget Hubble's technology is, is – it's been up there 32 years working, so that tech is about 40, 45 years old. So this is all newer stuff, and these instruments are so much more sensitive and capable – they're going to be looking at some early comets, which are some of the oldest things in the solar system, and looking at chemical signatures on those. And they're going to look at the TRAPPIST-1 uh, system, which is a star system, I think 200-something light years away from us, and getting spectrometry, spectrometer readings from the planet so we'll be able to see what some of their atmospheres are composed of. Mm. That may be the mind lower. You know, it may not be so much the visuals of it, but it's seeing... If we spot an exoplanet that has signatures in it of biology, Ooh. now this this would really be something. that would be a mind course, blower. Yeah, it will be, but there will be you know it's science, right? So there's going to be people saying, well, it could also be natural causes and all that kind of thing. Could be geological and so forth. But this is definitely the killer app for astronomy. And he was really uh, Clampett was really a great interview. You know, no matter what I asked him, I said, can we talk about exobiology a bit? And he said, sure, because you know, some people are a little queasy about that type subject, but and in, in the, the long and short of it was, he said, this is really, you know, going to be a whole new thing. They're trying to keep an open mind for everything. They've got a peer review system they've used for years to decide what targets to look at and how to look at them. But there's so many modalities on this thing. You know, it's like adjusting your digital watch, right? There's 1,700 different ways to set it up. So he said, you know, a lot of what they're looking for in these this first year projects is just discovering what modalities will work best. But they've anonymized the peer review process, so even if you and I snuck something in there, if it was good enough, they'd probably do it. Although I, I don't think that's that's on the on the table, but it could be. <laughs> we uh, got this guy named Leo Laporte. He wants to yeah. see if there's hot dogs in space. We're not going to do that. And it's interesting because part of how they do it is they look at the Hubble pictures and they start subtracting parts of the spectra out until they get redder and redder, and when they disappear. That means it's exceeded the limits of what the Hubble can do, and then that's some of what they're going to look at. It's mm. particularly interesting. So it's just, you know, besides the fact that it's a great project, it was just wonderful to talk to the top guy and get his take on it. And then as we move along, he's going to come back in a couple of months, come back on the podcast, so we'll be able to 
get more answers from him. He's going to be very busy for a few weeks because <laughs> yeah. everybody and their mother is going to be trying to get interviews. But uh, we Mark were very Clampin, lucky to be first in line. Uh, he is uh, NASA's uh, something or other, and uh, He's was the chief of science and exploration, <laughs> chief director. of science and exploration director, and He's was in charge of the web. And uh, will be it's a this week in space episode eighteen. Uh, twit.tv slash TWIS. And it's July 12th, right, that we will yeah. see these first images. Now, seeing the image won't necessarily change your mind or blow your mind, but it's still very exciting to see an image that's the, the deepest image we've ever taken of the universe, the farthest stars ever. And scientists, I think, are, are expecting to learn quite a bit. We just don't know Absolutely. what because we haven't learned it yet. And, and let's not forget, this mirror is six times larger than Hubble's, so it's going to be a Incredible. real Incredible. The first yeah. science-quality images of our universe, and uh, we'll see them July 12th. Thank you, Rod Pyle. Thank you. The Final Frontier. It's cool because uh, they've already, it's already been hit by three different um, micrometeorites, right? Yeah, Microme yeah we asked but, them about that. Yeah, it's, 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 it's tough, I hope. Yeah, but the thing about Lagrange, any Lagrange point, is there's a lot of other junk that yeah. settles out there because it is a stable orbit. So they knew they were going to encounter things. They didn't expect a couple of them to be quite as big, but it's it's pretty robust. And even if it took a hit on the mirror, it'd be okay. Um, now, are you going to be at sea by the 12th or not yet? I will be at s No, I will not be at sea. I will be here. Uh, are we? Our flight is the 14th. Oh, great. So, um, do you, what are we going to do? What time is it? 10 a.m.? What, what time is what? The reveal. The, are they doing oh, a press I'm conference? Sure. Let me see I if I can find out. it's 10 a.m. our time or their time. Because it'd be kind of fun to do a live. Yeah. Is that a Wednesday? No, it's a, a Tuesday, right? Yeah. Um, July 12th. That would be really cool to do something with that. Yeah, I can find out. Um, we... Um, John, Tuesday, of course, is it Tuesday, the July 12th? Let me look. I have a calendar. Yeah. yeah. yeah it's so that's, we have iOS today. Sorry, when, yeah, it is Tuesday. Yeah. Um, we have iOS today in the morning and then Mac Break Weekly, but I am willing to uh, take a chunk. Uh, it will be 10.30 a.m. Eastern. Oh, 7.30 a.m. our time. Right what before you iOS today. Delayed reveal? <laughs> no, you must be here. Okay. <laughs> I'll be in bed. Um, yeah, let's talk about it because maybe uh, it's going to be webcast. Yeah. Um, I don't know how long it'll go on for, but I, but I think it's very exciting. I think we should do something live. They'll have a press conference around it, so I, I think it'll let's be do it live. An hour. Yeah. Okay. Let's do it live. So what time does what time does iOS today begin, John? Nine. Perfect. So um, I'll be here. I'll come in. Uh, you can. We'll zoom you in. You can. Tarek can do it too. I can do it from home. Yeah. I think we should do that. Cool. Um, good. Make it so. <laughs> Tarek, Tarek won't be here. He'll, he'll still be on the road, but uh, I'll be here, and I can bring in Jeff uh, Notkin if we want. Whoever and, you uh, uh, think is appropriate. I'll be Walter Cronkite. Oh yeah. And now we're going to the do the drink. whole thing. Right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> that would be pretty funny. <laughs> Let's go to NASA and see what they've learned with the world's oldest oh, picture. The vibrations are tremendous. <laughs> it's a 13 million year old picture. Uh, good. That'll be fun. Yeah. Let's plan on that. 7.30 a.m. Tuesday, July 12th. All right. I'm putting it on my camera. And we'll stream that live. All right. Okay. Good. Excellent. excellent I shall excellent. see you next week, and then the week after on a Tuesday. And then you're, are you, so you're going to be then on Sunday next, or one? Then, so we're doing a rerun that Sunday. So you got that Sunday off. Okay. Which is the uh, 40th, 50th, 17th. But the 24th, I'm back. So you got okay. the 17th off. All righty. And that's the way it is. Then I'll be gone for all of August. Will you? Yeah. Where are you going? That's that's my little Arctic excursion. <gasps> so jealous. Lisa yeah. wants to do that too. She says. Yeah. I said Lisa, it's cold. It's, I mean, it's it's you know hundreds of miles from yeah. the nearest internet easy. or power or anything yeah. else, and there's 
a slit latrine and no showers. Okay. So just let her know. We won't be going there. <laughs> I can tell you, I don't care if she's going. I'm not going. And Thank burgers you. and dogs. Yeah. Thank you, Rod Pyle. All right, sir. See Take ya. Care. Bye. Good. That'll be fun. John, you'll do that. That's great. We'll do a live. That's such a big deal. It's huge. Huge. The great Woody Guthrie. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 8888 ask. Leo, oh, I that's the last segment of the show. So uh, we're gonna wrap it up. I do want to thank our fabulous musical director. Professor Laura, for giving us some great Fourth of July music. I love, I'm glad you ended with that one. That's a great song. He had a sticker on his guitar that says, This Machine Kills Fascists. Uh, great Woody Guthrie with an amazing song. Thanks also to Kim Schaffer, the phone angel, who uh, got you all on the air today. Thank you, Kim. I hope both of you have a great Fourth of July. All of you have a great Fourth of July weekend. Uh, continuing on with the calls, Donna in San Diego. Hi, Donna. I, I can't believe this. I've been waiting. I've been waiting to call you about this for about a year, and what I'm calling about is I was waiting for the Surface Studio Three. Oh no! And I, and I finally gave up. Oh no! You should give up. Yeah, I don't think. Of course, watch Microsoft will announce it tomorrow. But I. Well, I'm not going to. So I'm. I'm looking to instead. I'm waiting for my. Um, I have a Samsung All in One. That's, I think I bought it in 2015, and I know it's not going to last that much longer, so I was just getting ready to replace it when it conks out. And what I, what I really wanted was a large touch screen. Yeah. And, and, but what I, so far what I have for the... It's so funny that you computer. just... We just talked about this. Yes, I know. <laughs> it's so funny. Uh, yeah, yeah, with I, G. So, Scott, yeah. Yeah, so my solution, what I was, uh, what I kind of settled on was a Dell XPS um, desktop and then get monitors, uh, monitor or monitors, because I already searched for the touch screen and you can't get one large enough. I need, I need a. Well, that's what we was finding. That's what we were finding. Uh, you know, I thought yeah. there must be something bigger than 24 inches. There doesn't yeah. seem to be. Well, that, yeah, that's smaller than what I have now. And I, and I right. have, I'm, I'm uh, in my mid 70s i need to i need to be able to see the screen and i and i have uh, arthritis so i i use i use a touch screen i use i i want an optical drive and i i i think i'm going to end up getting that xps anyway but um and it, it come you can get one with an optical drive but you said don't get the core i7 but i already have a core i7 and i would be going down i'd be going a step down well this is okay so that's a good question first let me say this i may be wrong about the surface studio 3 uh it's been four years usually that means a company has given up on a product but you never know with microsoft they might well release another one i think there are a couple of reasons why it's reasonable to say there isn't going to be a new surface studio not only that they just haven't updated it uh in four years but you know, the last one was 2018. But I think because of parts shortages, the supply chain issues, that's not the computer Microsoft's going to release. Uh, it, well, it, it, yeah, I've, I've given up. I've just left that behind it's, it's in the sensible desk. To give, so, it's sensible to give it up. Now, so, so let me talk about this it, issue of Intel. What so, I was talking about is the newest generation. So, you know, every, yeah. every year or so, Intel does a TikTok with its processor. So an i7 you buy today is not the i7 you bought last year or the year before or the year before. We're in the 12th generation of Intel Core i7 processors. And there has been a big change between the 11th and the 12th generation. The 12th generation now is much more... Intel was influenced by what Apple is doing, what ARM has done, what uh, Qualcomm's done. And so these new processors have power cores and efficiency cores, uh, which means they are, in theory, more efficient because when you're doing tasks that don't require a lot of horsepower, they, were, they will use the efficiency cores instead and save battery power. In a laptop, that's pretty important, not just for battery power, but for heat. And this is the problem with the i7s in heat situations. In a laptop, an i7 almost never runs at full speed. It can only run at full speed for a few seconds, maybe a minute, because it, as soon as it gets hot, it throttles down. All Intel chips do this. All chips do this. It throttles down. 
Be early benchmarks of these new 12th generation chips, the Alder Lake chips, were very surprising. Now, these are early benchmarks. There are not a lot of 12th generation computers out yet. I have one right in front of me, but there are not a lot of them. And the early benchmarks showed something very surprising. Because of heat issues and because of these efficiency cores, it looks like the i5 actually outperforms the i7 in most situations. Yeah, I heard you say that before, and so I've, I'm kind of still debating. And right now, my main question is: Do you think I could use like a like two monitors? Sure. Uh, or, or or three. I, I just I want something big that I can see. But what I do is um, I watch. I'm watching like instructional vid videos or or concerts like like Metallica you, and. Um, you, you love Metallica. Like you love Metallica. Yeah. So it, it has to be. <laughs> I want really good video quality, and I want. Um, yeah. So let me uh, make so a suggestion. I would, I would like to let me make a suggestion. So, so you say you're interested in a laptop, or do you care if it's a laptop oh, or no, desktop? no, not laptop. It's a desktop. desktop. Okay. And by the way, the i7 on desktop probably doesn't have those same issues because cooling is much more active on a desktop. Yeah. Uh, you have more space. You have more fans. You have coolers. Uh, I would I run on my desktop at home a 55-inch OLED monitor. Okay, wait a second. I lost my pencil. <laughs> well, it's expensive. It's several oh, it's thousand good. bucks, but... Yeah, it's a TV. It's like a TV, but it's it, so it comes from Dell's Alienware division. Oh, okay. And well, what's a step down from what's the next uh, a lower, a smaller size? Because my desk isn't that big. Fifty five is huge, but I tell you, yeah, it let, spoils let, you because uh, and you certainly wouldn't want it any less than arms length away. You'd probably want it more like three or four feet away because it is yeah, so but I'm big. Getting, yeah. So is there? I'm afraid you're going to cut me off. Um, is there a smaller? I would oh yeah. Like. At least the thirty something. Yeah. Is there something like that? That's, sure. And it has to be touch screen, though. Touch screen. Oh, this is not a touch screen, yeah, yeah, and this yeah. is the problem. You yeah. will not get a monitor at that size. That's a yeah. touch screen. Just you won't. So, so if I got a touch screen for the middle, can I use? Yeah, you could have one with a touch screen. You could have set, all desktops will support multiple monitors. Yeah. Um, so yeah. that's not a problem at all. So, yeah, you could have a monitor that's a 24-inch on the left that's a touch screen. And when you want to watch Metallica, you put it on the big screen. Oh, yeah. That's or you do both. You're doing your touch screen on the left, and yeah. you got Metallica on your right. That's what I did. Ender night. Exit light. So uh, that's a great way to go. You have multiple monitors. Okay. And with a desktop, even with a laptop nowadays, that's a good thing to do. I would look at... Depending on how fancy you want to get, you can get arms, you know, yeah, get absolutely. visa mount arms so that you can have these things off the desk and you can uh, arrange them and orient them. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, well, tell me what you do with that. I mean, what, what brand would when you... When you get them, all of these monitors are visa, have V-E-S-A mounts. A visa okay. mount is a standard across all manufacturers, and then you'll okay. get an arm, and there are a variety of arms. You can search for the different, you know, you can have 15 monitors if you're a day trader, but you know, there are a variety of arms out there. They will all work with a visa mount monitor, so then you'll have, you screw the monitor onto the arm, and now with one pole coming out of your desk, you can have multiple monitors that you are very flexible in their arrangement. I think that's a very nice way to do okay. it. One little quick thing. Do you watch uh, Simon's Cat on, on YouTube? You should. I will. Simon's okay. Cat, huh? Yes. Is yeah. it a cat? It's kind of a, no, it's a cartoon. <laughs> <laughs> Is Metallica in it? <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I will watch it. Cat Man Do, Simon's Cat. They're shorts. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, hey, it's a pleasure okay. talking to you, Donna. Call, you know, we are out of time now, but call back. No, no, thank you. No, no, you did great. I didn't mean to rush you. Uh, oh, some some really good questions. I think, yeah, okay. what do you do on your computer? I watch... Um, besides I, watching Metallica and I, Simon's Cat. No, besides that, well, I, I, I do, uh, I use the Word and PowerPoint. So and, you're not doing any, you're not doing anything that needs a super high powered computer. Well, I think an I-5. I like to do, jump back and forth between like a Zoom thing is on and something else yeah. is on and I'm watching. Yeah, so get a lot of memory. That's more important. Get 32 gigs of memory. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Have a great geek week. More memory gives you more capabilities. It's not how much processor you need so much as memory. Well, yeah, I was just trying to future-proof it because I well, yeah. don't expect to be... I, this is probably going to be my last Your last computer. computer. I know the feeling. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It needs to last about five years at least. Oh, you're going so. for a lot longer than that. 
It's not your last computer. This is going to be the first of a long line. Um, I would say, especially if you keep watching Metallica, that keeps you young. I would say I, the, it, nothing you're describing requires an i7, especially in this new 12th generation. So, I didn't describe everything. Oh, <laughs> there's what I, more? What else? I, well, I would like... like I'd like to be able to watch two, have two videos on the that's, screen at the same all time. All that's easy. Screens. All that's easy. And it's then, video editing, Photoshop, 3D yeah. design. Those are the things, gaming. Yeah, well, that's what I, that's what I would be doing. Oh, you want to do some, some I do some video editing, but not oh, the okay. way you think of it, because it's for quilting. And they have oh, a... Neat. They, they, there are photographers that... It's an art... Oh, yeah, you should look up Jill Kirtle, a K-E-R-T-U-L-L-A... She's a photographer who's a quilt artist, and she edits the photography through fabric. Oh, how cool. It's, it is, really. It's beautiful. How cool. But, My mom is all into textiles. She was a weaver the whole time growing up. Uh, she does uh, needlepoint. She does... Um, Hooking, she hooked rugs my whole life, so very much into textiles. Lately, she's been making felted rats. <laughs> That's another story for another day. Uh, yeah, That's what you get for Christmas, huh? Yeah, I wish she won't give them to me. She says, no, I need them all. I said, Mom, just one, just one. Uh, I think you're in pretty good shape. It's really going to come down to budget. Uh, but touch well, is going to yeah, be the issue. It matter of the budget. Does, I mean, Surface Studio was pretty darn expensive. Yeah, no kidding. No yeah. kidding. Uh, these this will be less than that. Get a get a twenty four inch touch that you can use for all your touch screen stuff. You could even tilt it back. Have it, you know, like. Oh yeah, I want to tilt. Yeah. yeah, and then have a nice. You could even honestly get a TV monitor. Get a get a bigger four K TV. That you hook up to the computer, and that would be perfect for watching videos. It's it's oh. even fine for Word and stuff like that because nowadays the resolution is so good. So that's another yeah, way to do I, that. I edit the. I, I'm watching the instructional video, and then I yeah pause it, and then I use the snipping tool to yeah. cut out a part of it, and then make perfect. notes on it with it with a draw tool. Brilliant. But you have to do it really fast, and it, it slows down and. No, no, these modern computers, you're not going to have any problems. And yeah, get an i7 if you want. Um, you know, my gaming machine actually is AMD. The It's a Ryzen. Uh, those are very powerful multi-core computers designed for that kind of thing. And you might even, if you're going to do anything that requires heavy-duty graphics, not playing back video, but Photoshop, things like that, look at a, getting a, an NVIDIA graphics card. That'll make a yeah, big difference. Yeah, oh, that I do. I absolutely want that. I have that now. And I do. Uh, edit, I'm mean, editing the things. But who knows what's going to happen in, in um, three or four or five years. There might be some new thing. That's why it's not your last I, computer. Exactly. You can only future-proof so far. <laughs> right? Well, enjoy, Donna. I have to run, but thank you so thank much. You. It's a real okay, pleasure talking you. to you. Bye. Bye-bye. Well, that's it for the Tech Guy Show for today. Thank you so much for being here. And don't forget, TWIT, T-W-I-T. It stands for This Week at Tech, and you'll find it at twit.tv, including the podcasts for this show. We talk about Windows on Windows Weekly, Macintosh on Mac Break Weekly, iPads, iPhones, Apple Watches on iOS Today, Security on Security Now. I mean, I can go on and on and on. And, of course, the big show every Sunday afternoon, This Week in Tech. You'll find it all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next week with another great Tech Guys show. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next time.